we'll just sort of crack on. Okay. Thank you good. for coming on. Uh, mm-hmm. Thank you for agreeing to let me hijack your office in no quite a hectic technological way. It's quite intense. It's quite <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, for people who don't really know, I think hopefully if things go well, this will be listened to by hopefully loads of people from quite a wide range of places. Mm-hmm. So very briefly ish who sort of who are you what do you do okay um who am i <laughs> oh um what do you mean yeah what do you mean by that um so i am you want me to say my name as well? yeah say your name if you okay want. all right so i am uh amy isiski um so what do i do um i'm a clinical psychologist um that has then gone on to specialise in something called psychodynamic psychotherapy. Wow. Yeah, might have to explain that bit. Um, (laughs) Which is is kind of like psychoanalysis, so think Freud on the couch, exploring people's developmental pasts. Less less beard. Less beard, yeah, less, hopefully. (laughs) Maybe I waxed this morning, who knows. (laughs) You should have just committed to the full, full Freud and just turned up <laughs> massive beard. Maybe, maybe I'd have been more respected <laughs> if I'd have done that. I don't know. But um, yeah, so trying to make psychodynamic psychotherapy accessible because yeah. I think um, we can all use it. Don't have to be mentally unwell to use it. It's, it's something that if you're intrigued by the mind or interested in who you are and how you've come to be can be useful for everyone that's Um, that's a pretty good explanation of what we do yeah so i think there's probably a reasonable amount of confusion that you're not a sports psychologist (laughs) yeah there's a huge amount of confusion so without having to pick through the bookshelf of (laughs) and do a psychology degree Uh why aren't you a sports psychologist? Like, <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah. Like, like, like definition-wise, okay. could you do psychology with sports people? Yeah. So I do. Um, so I do clinical psychology with sports people, and I do psychodynamic psychotherapy with sports people. But I'm also a further specialist in neuropsychology. Right. So head injuries. So it's a big collection of stuff in terms of um, injury, brain injury, recovery after injury. Um, Basically, I work with athletes when there's um, clinical struggle. So sports psychologists work with athletes when there's a stable base and they're solid and robust um, and functioning well, no kind of like over struggles. And sports psychologists come in to enhance performance. So if you're, I suppose, naturally at like 100%, a sports psychologist will eke out the last bit. Yeah, yeah. Whereas you will deal with someone who might be at 20% and try and build up to... Yeah. Well, there's a whole range, really. It might be that I work with athletes that are are suicidal. It it might be that I work with athletes who have had an injury that are struggling to sit and not go back to training. I might work with athletes who have retired and are now having a crisis of identity. Who am I? Or I might be working with athletes where it's not a significant mental health difficulty, but there's just a bit of an internal conflict about yeah. why am I not performing to my optimum? What What's going on there? Is something off with my motivation? Is there another barrier in the way that's preventing it? Um, and so I'd get involved then as well. Okay, yeah, that's... Yeah, that makes a lot of sense that you're sort of dealing with the person rather than yeah. the athlete. Yeah, 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 exactly. So when did you... Did you start out as a clinical psychologist mm-hmm. and then happen to work with athletes or was it something you were professionally drawn to 
Okay, so it kind of organically happened. So I knew I wanted to be a clinical psychologist. I made that decision very early. Um, just why? Wow. Why? <laughs> that's a whole other podcast. Um, there was a reason. There, um, and so I made that decision very early and I was going to be a clinical psychologist, so I did it. But I think personally events did align outside of that which meant that um i was interested in mental health in yeah. high performance sport um and one of those reasons is so my background is in a variety of sports but probably rowing was my biggest sport yeah um and i was rowing at quite a high level um, when I was doing my first psychology degree um, and I was also invited to become a lightweight and that just opened my eyes yeah. <laughs> to a culture that um, was somewhat concerning yeah. and I kind of felt, hang on, if we weren't in a sports culture a lot of these girls would be seeing eating disorder clinicians yeah. But because we were in a sports culture... It's what you had to do to... Exactly, it's just yeah. part of it. And so I was exposed to that, um, training three times a day, doing what was required, whilst I was doing my psychology degree. And of course, yeah. the two aligned, and I thought, mm, this is a bit uncomfortable. Um, and then I, I competed at Henley um, one year, and then my appendix went after Henley and I had a choice. And it wasn't a career ending injury at all, but I kind of decided I don't think this is healthy. Yeah. Um, so I went back to um, college rowing at a much lower kind of level. To, so were you rowing to enjoy rowing again? Yeah, yeah. exactly, exactly that. Um, but then I'd kind of been exposed to something and I thought that's not quite right. So when I finished my doctorate training years later, I went back to the university coach and said, look, I'm now qualified. Just let me know if you've got any athletes that, that have any mental health difficulties and I'm, I'm happy to see them. And suddenly they were like, wow, this, this couldn't have come at a better time. We've got rowers that are self-harming, rowers with um, eating disorders. Yeah. Um, and we need to get you involved. But what I then found was that um, physically, some of these girls just couldn't even engage in therapy because right. they were physically so far gone, they needed physical health intervention because cognitively they, they just weren't functioning anymore. Wow, yeah, so that's, yeah. Um, I think a lot of sports have weight classes yeah. and yeah, a lot of the time someone might not be competitive as, say, a 105 strongman, yeah. but they could be really good as an under 90. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, exactly what that. do you do? Like, yeah, exactly that, yeah. And that, that was where I was. <laughs> so my power to weight ratio was not good enough as an as a open rower, but they saw that I could I could potentially break into the lightweight class and then yeah. my power to weight ratio would be really good. So it was encouraged. But yeah, it they the nature of rowers is that you have to be tall, yeah. long long limbs, wingspan, not so much as Tom Stoltman, but you know Yeah. I mean it'd make it, a good rower though. It, well, immense. Maybe yeah. we should put Tom in a boat, right? What do you think would happen? I don't know, it's maybe sink. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. It's quite powerful. <laughs> but how many uh so if you're in a pairs, it'd probably uh -huh. weigh hundred and thirty kilos, maybe hundred and forty for a pair. Okay, okay. So yeah. and they they're low on the water. Yeah, yeah. It depends who <laughs> we pair him with though, doesn't it? You know? Yeah, Tom and Luke. Like uh, three hundred and fifty kilos. Oh. Of, Oh, that's just my watch talking to you. I'm really oh, sorry nice. about that. Extra guess. Yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> um, so with like a whole world of sport that has weight classes, mm -hmm. if you could like wave a magic wand, what would you do to 
is there a way to fix like this broad world of sport and weight class? That, that's a huge question. So I've been talking this morning to David Smith, yeah. um, Paralympian, um, great, great individual. First time I've spoken to him actually, really interesting conversation. And we're, we were talking about his experiences in the sporting world with psychology and also just the competition structure throughout UK sport, um, the Olympics. We've got the Olympics in less than a week. Yeah, it's nuts, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. But we forget as a, as a country about the athletes that didn't make it and yeah. have still given years and years of their life to this. Yeah. And then they're kind of told by email that you're not in. That you're not in. See you in four years yeah. unless you're too old and then yeah. good luck. Yeah. And we were talking about really in an ideal world, wouldn't it be great if I wasn't needed for athletes? So actually yeah. clinical health difficulties weren't falling out of sport. Now, of course, athletes are human, so they're going to experience mental health difficulties. Yeah. That, that's a given, so clinical sight would be needed. But the the sporting system itself should not be creating the difficulties. Yeah, so you want to be dealing with people who you'd have dealt with if they weren't an athlete, yeah. rather than yeah. a lot of athletes. Yes, exactly. And so we've been talking a lot, and I think we're going to write some stuff on this, about... As a country, we're really reactive with our medical care. Yeah. So we kind of wait until things are really bad and then we'll do something about it. Yeah. Yeah, reactionary instead of preventative. Exactly. And it's almost always easier and cheaper to be preventative. Yeah. And it's less gnarly for the person going exactly. through it. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Because yeah. you've not got to go through it. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, you're preventing it. So so we want to think about could we look at doing a proactive or preventative model with athletes going through sport? And coming back to your original question with regards to weight categories, that would be part of looking at it in terms of I think in Norway they have a very proactive model where they have um, a department that looks after the athlete the whole way through that I think is separate to the performance team. Um, okay. So it's looking after the human first. Yeah, so they've got the coaches, they've got the support, uh, the support crew, but then yeah. there's another branch that yeah. looks after a person. Yeah. And it feels safe to do that as well. Um, and, and with horse riding as well, um, and talking to jockeys so mark enright in the book um we spoke about how weight categories for horse racing yeah. has has moved forward as physiologically we've changed we're taller we're heavier and jockeys have been given a heavier weight than before but it's still not in keeping with the trajectory of change in terms of physiological change so okay. So I think it's the same with rowing. I, I don't know when the last time was that the rowing uh, weight limits changed. Yeah. Um, so we need to look at whether the weight limits that are still set are appropriate. And then we need to put in a proactive model around these athletes, knowing what we know now in terms of what are the additional pressures for these athletes. Yeah, because a, a lot of the world has moved on in yeah. massive ways. Mm -hmm. And it does seem that sport has this it's sort of grandfathered in like yeah well, it's just what we do yes and yeah. i know olympic weightlifting has changed weight classes a few times okay but that's only because people have been uh pots for steroids oh, and it's easier to change a weight class than it is to ban 40 people so what have they done they've moved the weight brackets up uh they've moved it used to be i think above 120 kilos then it went to 105 then 110 they just moved them mm. around because basically i think if you came i think the biggest something like 13th i might be wrong but someone who finished 13th in an olympic year has now been given gold because everyone's been popped 
Wow. So they change the weight classes. Wow. Just so people have to change something, and it means that they can take records away without taking a record away, because there's also a lot of money and corruption in the Olympics mm -hmm. on quite a big scale. Mm -hmm. So a lot of, say, Russian athletes won't get banned, but they'll get retired okay. so they can keep their record and they can keep, you know, sort of jump before you push sort of thing. Wow. So that's led to weight class changes. Okay, okay. But I think sports where that's not as prevalent, the weight classes have just stayed pretty Mm. pretty much the same for yeah. a long time yeah pretty static yeah um do you think having a way of determining weight class by sort of physical markers so you know if you're over six foot two mm. you can't be a lightweight because it's going to be unhealthy mm. do you think that's a way to well, skew things a bit. <laughs> it's it's interesting, isn't it? I mean, from I can only talk from personal experience. I I can remember being uh, fat tested, so skin fold tested, yeah, and being told by the the oh my goodness, I, I would it be a physiologist or someone? Would it be the sports physiologist? Yeah. Sorry, sorry to any sports physiologists if that's the right term, but um. I can remember being fat tested and being told, look, you shouldn't be going any lower than this, that this, you know, you're on the edge. Yeah. And then I'd walk through one door into the gym and it was straight back on the training program because I had another two and a half kilos to lose. So it's, <laughs> it's, it's not about, I don't know, in an ideal world, yes, absolutely, that there would be limits to yeah. what we would be asking. But, you know, we were talking about power to weight ratio yeah. earlier. If you can make a six foot two person hit that weight, then I guess the argument would be that the power to weight ratio that you'll establish from that is going to be exceptional. But ultimately, if that person is malnourished, their fat percentage is so low, cognitively they're knocked off because in order to hit that weight, they've had to um, sweat run and yeah. water loss and it's not actual natural fat loss, um, then you're not gonna get peak performance from that individual. Yeah, so you're forcing them into this theoretical benefit Yeah. that realistically, if you're super dehydrated, Yeah. You can't perform at the level that they've judged you at yeah, anyway. Exactly. I think, um, I don't know if it's the UFC, but the, some fight companies have bought in like weight cut limits. Okay. So, like the week before a fight, you can't be more than, say, 10% overweight. Oh, that's interesting. Okay. Because I think like, three guys died from the same promotion, or not the same event, but the same promoter. Wow. And it was. One, I think, got really ill during a weight cut and maybe died from complications and a couple were just, you know, you're getting hit in the face. Like, you need, you need to at least be in good physical shape to yeah. deal with yeah, yeah. putting yourself through that. Yeah. So then they've brought in these weight cut limits to... That's interesting. So, because in the world of horse racing as well, um, there's a lot of um, research that's done in terms of fools yeah. because of how jockeys don't see themselves as the athlete. They see the horse as the athlete. Yeah. So ultimately, as, you know, as long as, I'm sure it's not the same for all jockeys, but if, if I eat crap and then sweat um, and maybe take some Lasix, which are street street name known as piss pills yeah then ultimately i'll i'll just be at that weight um but cognitively you're switched off so it's it's been found to be associated to increase falls okay it's uh, an increase in the severity of the fall or like an increased risk of head injury mm -hmm. in falls within people who are 
sort of underway as well then? I don't know. I don't know whether that research has been done because, of course, ethically it had to be... <laughs> that I think they did it under experimental conditions, but ethically they could only ask people to sweat down a certain percentage of their weight yeah. and then get on a... I think it's called an equisizer. Oh, the legless yeah. horse yeah. thing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the creepy-looking things. Yeah, and then they watch performance. So it's, yeah, interesting. But there's certainly increased risk to the jockey and yeah. others around them if that percentage of weight stripping has been greater in yeah. the in the small amount of time before the event rather than if it is a long-term run up to it yeah so the difference between like losing weight and making weight yeah like, yeah if you've got to make weight yeah i know people have done some nut stuff to yeah. make weight yeah but i also know people who've spent like a year losing weight mm. and are performing as well as they were when they were heavier they're just yeah. lighter yeah exactly um and i just like with the jockeys and stuff it's really interesting that because like jockeys are pretty amazing people and you know i remember growing up and we had some like my mum and her partner at the time they had like shares in a race horse mm -hmm. however that works you'd go and you'd see like ruby walsh race and you'd be like this is wild like mm -hmm. you're seeing someone do something amazing and then like i read like started reading your book and i'm like why aren't they really happy like what's going on <laughs> like you're doing something awesome and yeah. you're just at such a like it's so dangerous like horses are scary like i don't care what you say a horse doesn't want you on it like they might be all right with it but uh -huh. like a horse could definitely kill someone like that's a they're massive they're really strong mm -hmm. they've got like really hard feet yeah dangerous thing to be around yeah like jockeys should be looked after and I know, I know. like realizing reading through so like they're not being fed properly mm -hmm. and they're not mm -hmm actually yeah. looked after no yeah it's just not part of the culture i think things are improving you know we, we've all we've got these sporting organizations now like the professional jockeys association yeah. that are supporting jockeys and trying to change that culture but some of these sporting cultures are so entrenched that yeah how do we change it i, I don't yeah know. it needs to be it can't be drip fed either it needs to be quite a radical change yeah and essentially need a whole board of directors to retire and a new generation come in who aren't related to the old board of directors. Yeah. But what's the, um, is there a time limit for like a way in for rowers? Because in Strongman it's normally two hours or 24 hours. Mm -hmm. So you weigh in the day yeah. before or on the morning of a con. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So we're talking kind of almost 20 years ago now for me, but from what I can remember, I think it was on the morning and then you could kind of try and get something in. Yeah. So there's um, really not proper time to no, no. get back to. No. Yeah. Because no. we're talking, talking to like strong men and strong women. The complaint from them is on a 24 hour way in someone could walk around at 115 kilos mm -hmm. weighing at 105 because you only have to weigh 105 whilst you're stood on a scale okay and then 24 hours later be back over 110 wow yeah okay so but then obviously with rowing you don't necessarily want to be heavier anyway no you don't but you want to be able to perform so you want to feel nourished enough yeah to perform and i i I don't think you have that window <laughs> to no just to force it in and yeah yeah what um so you did you say started working with head injury or is that your specialist no that's secondary? come yeah that's come much later um so yeah so when when you train to be a clinical psychologist you kind of you'd hope that'd be enough really but you, <laughs> yeah, you kind of, but, but then you kind of have to specialize and so people tend to specialize in a, a type of therapy so right. um you've 
probably heard of cognitive behavioral therapy, yeah. so CBT. So a lot of people will specialize in that. So that will be how they treat mental health conditions. Okay, so you have your, the umbrella of clinical psychology yeah, yeah, and yeah. then you can, yeah. you're all trying to achieve the same goal, but you pick which route to that exactly. goal you want. Yeah, it's a really nice way of putting it, yeah. So um, when you do your doctorate, you get three years of being trained in CBT, family therapy, psychodynamic training, um, and you you work across, so you get clinical placements across child services, adult services, older adult services, um, learning disabilities, and then you specialise for a year. Yeah. So, so your doctorate kind of gives you that broad experience and then you kind of specialise. Um, and it, it means that when someone comes into the clinic as well, you, you should be able to spot which therapeutic model will be the best fit for them as well. Right. So it, it's not like one size fits all. So the, the advantage of having the clinical psychology training is that you should be able to sit with someone, do an assessment session and then say, do you know what? I think actually you'd be better for a CBT therapist. So I'm going to okay. signpost you onto a CBT therapist because um, I work in a psychodynamic way. So, you, yeah, it isn't a clinical psychologist. You're all sort of working together to... Yeah, well, hopefully, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> we hope that there's some, some level of yeah. mutual respect with stuff. D definitely, in the... Look, it's, it's all about fit. And I hope we're all in this for the same reason in that we want to offer the best um, experience for the people that come to us and we yeah. want the best outcome for them. And if they're not going to get the best outcome from me, then I need to signpost them to the person that's going to give them the, yeah. the, most, the biggest likelihood of getting that best outcome. No, I'm exactly the same with my coaching. Like I've said, I be better off going this way yeah yeah definitely sort of selfishly it's quite a lot of work <laughs> and there's only so much work you can do yeah yeah so there's no point just going oh well I, you know could do with a bit more money i'll just take more people on for yeah. the sake of it yeah with the sort of head injury side of stuff and something that a debate that's interested me since like as a kid playing rugby mm. is there's like huge amounts of concussion in rugby and yeah, yeah. American football and mm -hmm, like mm -hmm. high contact sports. And it seems that the general argument is to just put helmets on. Mm. But from my understanding, and I'm more than happy to be wrong about it, mm. from what I know, that doesn't really help no, it doesn't. beyond a point. Yeah. Like, you're absolutely right and there's research that says that actually that makes things worse because you've got a helmet on and it's fine to yeah it changes the internal psychology of the person that's then wearing the helmet that then thinks that they're protected and they're invincible yeah we used to run into walls where we're in american football helmet because oh well, damn that's got a helmet on. it's that's safe not... <laughs> it's totally fine have you had an assessment <laughs> no i just avoid them <laughs> Oh dear. It's dear. the best coping mechanism is okay, total just avoidance. total avoidance. That's what we're recommending here. I hope people don't get that wrong. <laughs> just ignore everything. Oh gosh. Okay. I, I, mm. but I yeah. hope people don't get that from this. I'm trying to encourage people oh, no, no. to access the therapy. The fact that for some reason I'm influential is terrifying. I like, think it's wonderful. Listen to I, other people. They're I think much it's great. Smarter. No, no, you're doing yourself a disservice. But no, we like straight helmet on, safe, can't get hurt. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. yeah. It changes the psychology. I think they've found it in rugby as well that if you if you put, um, oh my goodness, what are they called in like rugby? A, scrum cap. a cap. Yeah. Yeah. It it actually increases the prevalence of risky behaviour on the field. Yeah, you because you've got you, it, it's safe. Yeah, you think it's safe. And it's so, <laughs> like that thick. I know. Like, I know. Yeah. Well. It's like a centimetre thick bit yeah. of foam. Yeah, yeah. Velcro's yeah. on and 
rarely yeah. do the valve grow up because it gets a bit warm. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it's not just in the sports that we expect head injuries to be prevalent in as well. It's not just rugby and NFL. It's now football. So heading the football as well yeah. has been shown to link to concussion um, impact upon uh, brain development, especially in children. I as suppose well. it's repetitive as well. So exactly. it might not be. So when my dad was playing football, I think he played sort of semi-professionally back in the day. My mm-hmm. family were all footballers. Yeah. They had like, it was a leather football that was stitched yes. together. Exactly, yeah. And he said like, he's seen people head a ball and just be yeah. knocked out from it. Yeah, yeah. Like one impact, like they were fine, yeah. go for a big header, knocked out. Yeah. yeah. And obviously now, that's unlikely to happen mm. because balls are mm-hmm. not leather. Mm-hmm. But if you, is the brain as a thing, does it, is it cumulative? So could mm. you have, mm-hmm. yeah. say, just to attach numbers to it, say an impact of 100 mm-hmm. would knock you out. Mm-hmm. Would 50 impacts of two mm-hmm. have the same mm. level as damage to the brain or? I don't know whether it would be considered the same, but what we do know from these impact sports that have repetitive um, bashes to the head, if we call it that, um, we know that there is now a condition called CTE. So I'm I'm going to attempt to say it, and I'm going to be absolutely slaughtered (laughs) if I say it incorrectly, but I think it's chronic traumatic encephalopathy what a word. What a word. I, I don't know if I've said it correctly. <laughs> Whatever you said <laughs> sounded good. So Did it? We'll go with that. Okay, we'll go with that. We'll go with that. Just confidence. So, yeah. So CTE, so we know, which is horrific, we shouldn't be smiling at all. Um, so CTE is ultimately an Alzheimer's type presentation or a dementia type presentation where you have cognitive decline. Yeah. And um, so weaken performance in terms of uh, memory, um, frontal lobes as well in terms of emotional regulation, so a lot of impulsivity, a lot of irritability. You know, a lot of NFL players have um, engaged in riskier behaviour post-retirement. Um, yeah, some of them have gone a bit wild. Yeah, yeah. Because if you think of the nature of the hit within NFL as well, it's face-to-face contact a lot of the time. Yeah. So you get a lot of frontal hits and that's where our executive functioning is localized. So the kind of higher order stuff, the planning, the problem solving, the emotional regulation, um, the, the personality changes as well. So the impulsivity and inhibiting those behaviors which we know are probably socially not that acceptable. That's what our frontal lobes control. So if you get repetitive hits, um, you can often see a personality wow. change in these individuals as well. So would that be um, arguably the reason someone like Muhammad Ali developed Parkinson's and Potentially. dementia? Because do you think it's sort of an unanswerable question, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Like someone like that, do you think he would have developed some form of sort of Parkinson's dementia anyway? Or I suppose what I'm asking is, if you were probably going to get it, does CT mean you're definitely going to get it? Or can it take someone with no genetic predisposition to those sort of illnesses? and give it to them. Yeah, you don't have to have any genetic predisposition. Shit. For wow. CTE. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, it's just repetitive hits to the head. And, you know, this is... Um, goodness, there's... Will Smith's in a film about it, isn't it? Concussion. The yeah. whole NFL scandal about people trying to cover it up. But oh, yeah. when they... Um, autopsied NFL players afterwards there was this narrative originally that it was Alzheimer's or it was Parkinson's or dementia but ultimately there's key markers within the brain that suggest it's CTE it presents very differently okay so symptomatically it might be similar yes but once yeah. you've gone into autopsy level it might yeah. it's a different thing yeah yeah 
Wow, that's um, yeah, it's really weird. Like playing rugby as a kid, I got knocked out quite a bit, and I remember just being knocked out, and then mm. you just carry on. Yeah, and that's yeah. what yeah. fifteen years ago. Like in the grand yeah. scheme of things, it's, and that's at school level where you should be. Yeah, yeah. Super careful with anything, but yeah. Well, our brains are still developing until we're twenty-five. And, right. and it's those frontal lobes that are the last part to develop as well. Okay, so is that why in like extreme sports, younger athletes tend to be more extreme? Because <laughs> yeah, they just part, don't yeah. have that yeah. way of processing risk yeah. as well. Yeah, that and adolescents, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yes. Yeah, I've got loads of testosterone. <laughs> yes. Yeah, hormonally, where we're, we're going for it, you know. <laughs> it's um, I find, I do find it interesting because you can see, like watching like the mountain bike world cup that's happening at the moment. You see the younger guys, and they are just pinned like they, mm. like their brakes are almost cold at the end of a run. Like they've not used them that much, mm-hmm. but they hits a point. And it's probably 25, 26, mm-hmm. where you see those guys doing like a track walk and they're looking at every line and they're trying to save a tenth and they're yeah. treating it like a yeah. like a racing sport. Yeah. Rather than There's much more strategy. Yeah, it's not I'm yeah. gonna go that way yeah. really quick. And yeah. it'll probably be fine. Yeah. yeah. So that I suppose is in some way linked to that waiting for things to develop yeah. that let you process mm-hmm. risk and fear and exactly exactly yeah yeah what's um what have you got like a dream athlete client like sport like if you could if someone said right you can only work with rowers or boxers or strongmen or this where would you want to go into do you know no one's ever asked me that um, I don't know whether I have a dream sport to go into. Um, I just love working with people. Yeah. And all of my work isn't sport either. You know, yeah. I work with um, people with mental health difficulties. I work with people that have sustained brain injuries from spontaneous events, um, stroke, yeah. uh, hemorrhage. Uh, or catastrophic life events, and so so is our car crash. Yeah, like yeah, something bad has happened. Yeah, exactly. Um, and I don't know. I I just feel incredibly fortunate and privileged to be working with anyone. Um, yeah, it's it's incredible for people to walk into a room, trust you develop a relationship and then see change happen and I I don't think that I've got any kind of oh I really want to do this or I really I just I just really enjoy what I do with whoever walks that's in the really room. That's really cool that's because it is like you make I assume because you seem to be quite good at this well, you cheers. make Thanks. massive differences <laughs> to people. I hope so I yeah. hope so. The thing is, it's one of those things that, um, by the very nature of what I do, you invite people to bring problems. Yeah. And um, when people are well, it's almost like you don't want to hear from them because they're doing well. And, yeah. And you just have to trust that that silence means that they're doing all right. But you yeah. don't you don't often get to hear the the what's going on and and occasionally you'll get a lovely letter or a lovely card just telling you do you know what or a message saying I'm doing really well and that that that's incredible to, to yeah. get that feedback. No, it um, must be amazing because it's like with sport and coaching, it's generally mainly influencing one aspect of what's going on. Yeah, yeah. But psychology is everywhere. It's every day, like everything you do yeah, yeah. is affected by it. So yeah. I suppose not hearing from people is yeah. it's a weird business model. Yeah. 
it's it's it is it's it's the worst business model yes exactly (laughs) you know someone walks in the clinic and it's bizarre that the agenda is that i want us to get to a position where you don't need me anymore it's it's a terrible business model (laughs) you know (laughs) but but ultimately it's it's incredible because that means that people have moved on and life's good and yeah that's great that's all you want no it's really it is like amazing like I find stuff like this fascinating that like brains are weird like <laughs> they trip me out like there's so much going on in there that uh-huh. you just live with but then when you start to look at and think like mm-hmm. why is why does this happen why do I feel like this yeah. you just go oh shit like, there's a lot going on yeah and yeah. then yeah. you're dealing with loads of them yeah, loads of brains. <laughs> just loads Lo- of brains. Just loads of brains. Yeah. Do you find it hard to switch off from it, uh, or are you like always? Uh-huh. You like go out to a pub and you're like, oh, "Why is oh they're sat a bit weird? What's going on there?" Like, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. I, I think, if if you if you do this job, it's inherently who you are. Yeah. You know, I think once you see something. So we had a chat the other month. Okay once you experience the world in a certain way and you notice something you kind of can't stop noticing it yeah it's super annoying yeah sorry about that (laughs) so (laughs) so, you know that thing you've never thought about yeah you're going to think about it all the time yeah yeah yeah. so and you can't stop it once you once you know it you know you can't undo it once you've seen it so i i don't do it as a conscious thought process i don't go out and want to analyze and you know god i'm a human at the end of it i want to go and live my life and enjoy it and um switching off is good for all of us you know it's all about balance um but inherently i guess it's in in part of who i am you spot things that maybe wasn't yeah exactly and i think probably my lens in which I view the world is probably different from someone who doesn't do this job. Yeah. But similarly, I'm sure the lens in which you look at people yeah. and their bodies yeah. and how they train in the gym is very different to my lens when I yeah. look at people in the gym. So yeah. I think, yeah, there's a lens, of course. But yeah. yeah. What, what do you do to switch off? Like if it's just, <laughs> you know, a hectic day. Yeah. What's your you know, you've clocked out or whatever. Mm-hmm. You, I assume you don't have a clock in your <laughs> no, machine. No. But <laughs> like, where do you go? Where do I go? Um, so sport yeah. is my, is my go-to. Yeah. So it's, I, I grew up in a sporting family. It's, it's what we did. They were the happiest times swimming water. Yeah. Um, we've spoken about paddle boarding. Um, just being outdoors yeah walking no it's um i'm the same really yeah go somewhere yeah. feel small yes everything disappears yeah like, yeah it's, i found with um when i was up in scotland last like we went out into the sea and it's like, oh i'm tiny okay that's it like, yeah, yeah. i was a bit stressed about something but yeah now i'm trying not to drown because yeah. i'm in the sea with a load of half naked scottish men <laughs> One of who is screaming at the waves. Oh, who is that? Lewis. Luke's best Oh, mate. right. Okay. He's, okay. Um, he's intense. Like, okay. he's amazing. He's such a nice guy, but he was, like, just screaming at the sea. Okay. And I was like, what, what has happened? <laughs> <laughs> it's like drones flying around. Oh. Mulligans are there with, like... Wow. Uh, and I was okay. like, this is... Okay. This is a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Did you enjoy it? It was... You felt... In the best possible way, totally empty afterwards. Oh, interesting. Because you just, you've tried to stay alive in your own little way. Okay. And it was really cold, windy, like the waves were, mm-hmm. I mean, they're over Tom's head. Like they were oh, wow. big old waves wow. like, that okay. were all getting thrown about. And it was like, yeah, you just feel nicely empty. Okay. Well, we're only at about one or two foot this evening in Newcastle so that will be easier to swim this evening yeah we can just pop in (laughs) just pop for an evening you've brought your wetsuit haven't you no 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 tactically not bought the wetsuit 
<laughs> um, my <laughs> different recommendation to Newcastle though, because Dale, who I spoke to yesterday, was like, go okay. and get a Palmo. A Palmo? <laughs> So that's proper Newcastle. Are we getting palmos tonight? I don't think it fit. Do they do vegetarian palmos? I don't know. I can try and make you a palmo at home. It's not a problem. We'll see what we can do. I'll, I'll get a palmo recipe. We'll do it. Just <laughs> fanciest like, veggie palmo. Oh, with some broccolini oh, nice. and some stuffed peppers. That would be nice, wouldn't it? We'll do a fancy palmo for you. <laughs> Just northeast fusion. Yes. <laughs> yeah. What's um, what are you still doing sport now? Do you still compete uh, in anything or? No, no, I'm not competing at all. Um, I, it's more um for pleasure. Yeah. Um, and it makes it makes me feel better. I think once sports always featured in your life, it's it's just a part of who you are, and moving is a part of who you yeah. are. Um. Yeah, I'm not competing at the moment at all. I like to keep fit because it, yeah. it makes me feel good and I enjoy it. Um, and at the moment, it's interesting. Going Doing this job through COVID um, has demanded a lot. Um, there's been a lot of staring at a screen. Yeah. Um, and people have been struggling. Um, so I've, I've definitely kind of changed my training routine a bit in that I found that training on the morning, just for half an hour, so moving my body before I had to sit down in a chair yeah. for eight to 10 hours, because this isn't a very active job. No, <laughs> the, the, <so> listening <laughs> yeah. is, is yeah, th this not is, physically This taxing. is my activity, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so, so it's not good for back health um, or just moving in general. Um, so I've kind of found that training just on the morning has been really helpful and then just walking on the evening to keep yeah. moving really yeah um, have you seen a big sort of impact during covid in sort of a broad psychological sense have you oh yeah yeah huge yeah it it was probably um one of the most challenging times to practice psychology because um psychology is about change yeah if it's done well and people want to embrace that we all say we want to change but then when we try and do it it's hard work oh it's but, so much easier to complain than it is to actually well, change yes exactly <laughs> it's really easy yeah yeah but we can't collude with that you know we've, we've got to kind of help people move um so but covid was just people were stuck yeah and you know, there was a lot that you couldn't change situationally. And it was really hard for people to change and be hopeful. And there was a lot of being stuck and just having to validate. Yeah. 18 months of validating really that, yeah, this is, this is terrible. Yeah, I suppose a lot of people's go-to coping mechanism is distraction. Hmm. So then when you almost legally can't distract in the same way. Yeah, yeah. You, you sort of laid bare to yourself. You've yeah. just got to deal with it. Yeah, really, really astute in that if you're left with yourself and your own mind and space because you're not doing what you used to do, that, that can be really troubling. Yeah, it's, um, yeah, it's something that took me a while to get happy with. Yeah. Um, but now we just sort of go like I spend a stupid amount of time in a car or sat staring at a screen mm -hmm. or I'll go and climb by myself or just do stuff and you do just feel I think once you learn to understand yourself a bit and accept yourself then yeah, yeah. It is, it's just nice because yeah. yeah. there's no other distractions yeah. yeah where do you see um I've been just been listening to a podcast on the way over talking about um sort of medication being the go-to mm. cure all um but the correlation between it was in america and the percentage of school shootings that took place in relation to people taking antidepressants or you know prozac or I can't remember what else it was, but uh, is it SSRs? SSRIs, yeah. Yeah, so uh, there's a yeah. super high 
proportion of people who end up you know, doing school shootings and going nuts or mm-hmm. doing fairly bad things later in life who have been treated just with medication. Like that's the go-to, I think, especially in the States wow. because healthcare is a business rather than a... It's expensive, yeah. Yeah, so give people drugs rather than yeah. seeing them. Mm. Where would you... Do you think step one should be clinical psychology or therapy or whatever it is that's needed? Mm. Or, you know, dose people up and then deal with it? So, because I'm a psychologist, um, I don't prescribe. So, right. psychiatrists will prescribe. Okay. They're, they're more kind of assessment of is medication helpful. Um, so, I, I don't prescribe medication. Um, but um, medication is, is a complex area yeah. um, in that I'm well aware that for some people it will be very helpful yeah. um, and that in terms of access to therapy at the moment it's incredibly hard to access therapy um, in the NHS uh, because demand is so high yeah there are long waiting lists so sometimes people may require something to help them in the short term like an intervention rather than as a yeah yeah. it's not ideal but you know i i'm not unaware that asking people to pay for therapy because the nhs waiting lists are so long is also you know that that's often very inaccessible to a lot of people as well. So yeah. what options are left? Um, so we have to think about this in you know real world scenario. Um, in terms of use of medication for individuals that come and see me, um, sometimes it's required um, for individuals that are really struggling that might... Um, so for example depression might struggle to get up in the morning might struggle to function might struggle to get dressed it might just give a little bit of a short-term intervention which will then enable them to access therapy yeah and then therapy will work alongside medication as a longer term intervention so that then the medication can be titrated down yeah and then the longer term change can be elicited by therapy Okay, yeah, that's a really interesting way of looking at it. Yeah. Because I think, you know, it's so easy to just be black and white about, yeah, yeah. you know, this is bad, this is good. Yeah. But dealing with people, you are mm-hmm. dealing with people. Yeah. Like, there is a spectrum yeah. of people and what's... Definitely, and it's so individual as well. You know, I, I again, my, my motivation is to get the best outcome for the individual. Yeah. So if medication as part of that pathway is going to get the best outcome for that individual, then let's do it. Yeah. No, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. So you, so you're sort of prescribed more than like you're a thing that people are told to try yeah. rather than... <laughs> yeah. If, if possible. I mean, you know, the other thing about medication is that there can often be... Uh, side effects that a lot of people yeah. don't like um, so some people don't experience them as much others do um, yeah. but there are reasons why some people just don't like being on medication yeah I'm sort of try not to yeah yeah but also sickening hippie so it, it's within the remit <laughs> okay so it fits fits yeah. the type okay yeah <laughs> but I, I just I'm of the opinion mm. that a lot of things can be solved naturally before medication yeah but mm. then equally if someone needs medication then they need it like yeah. there's no yeah yeah I mean look there's there's a whole range of mental health difficulties that I work with and ultimately if someone is self-harming and suicidal and is unable to emotionally regulate or access therapy, then yes, we we probably should be looking at medication. But ultimately, if someone is struggling 
um, but they are able to access therapy and they can tolerate the space in between the weekly sessions, yeah. then, then let's do this without medication. Yeah, no, that makes loads of sense. It yeah. seems really obvious is a good way to go. Yeah. Do you, so just through ignorance, what's the difference between a psychologist and a psychiatrist, mm -hmm. sort of broadly yeah. speaking? So a psychologist has a background in psychology. <laughs> this is stating <laughs> the obvious, things. isn't it? What's this, the difference between a plane and a house? really <laughs> helpful, isn't it? I'm really educating here. So, the, so, so I say that because a psychiatrist has a background in medicine. <laughs> Okay. okay, so right. there, there was a reason for that. So, um, yeah, so, so a psychiatrist has a, a medical background, so they would have trained as a medical doctor. Right, so psychiatry is a specialism within medicine. Exactly, exactly. Okay, so that makes... Yeah, yeah. And then they will look at uh, medication, but as psychiatry is developing as a field, they are also looking to specialise in one talking therapy now, I think. I'm sorry if I've got that incorrect, but I think there is this idea that they should be recommending more so than just medication right. as well. But then in terms of delivery of the talking therapy, um, that would be myself or a psychotherapist. Or, um, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so you could see... A psychiatrist in a hospital yeah whereas a psychologist would tend yeah. to be in an office scene. um yeah although i've worked on inpatient settings as well um so you you can see a psychologist there's a lot of psychologists in hospitals right. um health psychologists as well it's it gets complicated doesn't it yeah um yeah yeah it's so easy to it for it just to be oh, it's psychology it's yeah. brain stuff yeah but there's yeah yeah I'm sort of very slowly starting to understand that yeah yeah there's a lot yeah there's uh, a lot going yeah. on and there's a huge range of psychologists so in terms of my background wasn't an initial medical degree it was a psychology degree but then my doctorate was a clinical doctorate so it wasn't a research PhD mine right. was a clinical doctorate so again that you can then have research psychologists as well so yeah, yeah there's a lot yeah it, get, it gets really confusing and i guess now is a good time to say um i i really want people to um become educated consumers of well-being services yeah because when when you struggle with mental health you're in a vulnerable position yes and it would be great if we knew who would be the best person to see at that time. Yeah, so sort of, rather than having to go through a wild system where it's just, you could have a clear room. Yeah, yeah. And, and know that there are a variety of individuals that you can see that can help you. And this is probably going to be the best fit. Yeah, so what's, it's really hard to phrase things without it sounding either super specific or needlessly broad. <laughs> but say someone was, I don't know if there's such a thing, but like a normal level of depression. Mm -hmm. Like not, they can cope, but something's going on. Yeah. Where would the, what's step one? Where would you? sort of recommend yeah well it depends if they want to go down statutory services if that's the case it would be going to the gp explaining that you're depressed um your symptoms and then the gp will explore either talking therapies or medication with you depending upon how severe the depression is right if you want to access private services you can see a clinical psychologist but then you can also consider cognitive behavioural therapy for depression yeah. or psychodynamic psychotherapy for depression. Yeah. So this is when it gets a bit complicated. Um, so it's about looking at what level you want to go in at and okay. what's the best fit for you. 
but and I, I don't want to I don't want to push therapists to one side because they're excellent and they're wonderful at what they do but I guess it's making sure that you find one that knows what's the best fit for you and asking that question yeah. of the therapist in the room can you tell me what's going to be the best fit for what I'm presenting with and having the confidence to ask that as well yeah so it's understanding that it's not just a therapist you it's like you you're not all the same yeah we're not all the same we're not and that's what makes it really challenging but I guess the important thing is that if you're going to see someone it's having that confidence to ask are you the best fit for me yeah because if they if they're in the job for the right reason they should yes. be more than happy to say no exactly speak to this person yeah exactly yeah so where would you sort of swinging back to the athlete side of stuff would you sort of exclusively work with people who I don't want to say have something wrong with them but you know what I mean like yeah. are presenting some form of sort of mental health issue or yeah. would you do you deal with people in that more sports psychology way mm. that we mentioned before um no i'm not a sports psychologist if, if if an athlete came to me and said i just i'm good everything's great i just want to enhance this part of my shot or this part of my game i'd be like i'm, I'm not the right person for you okay yeah that's sort of explains that difference really mm -hmm. well um who who do you think should be influencing sport to look after the mental health of the athletes is it you know is it a government thing does it need to become mm. a legislation yeah. that you know yeah. regardless of who or do you think it's down to each governing body because sports are mm -hmm. so varied mm -hmm. um we've had this discussion this morning actually <laughs> um it's huge isn't it sport yeah. and and it happens at so many different levels recreational competitive grassroots uh the sports minister um at government level yeah. um asked tammy gray thompson to write a duty of care paper and okay. that's been written um, in terms of what's happened since then I think, I think some changes have happened but ultimately I think there needs to be a working party <laughs> yeah. to, to look at this in terms of organisationally what's happening with sport yeah. um, and I do not know a lot about this so forgive me but I've been told this morning that UK sport have a performance uh, document <laughs> that's terrible i'm gonna oh goodness i'm gonna be heavily criticized here um but um it's it's whether or not it's being applied in the right way and thought about in the right way in terms of human first yeah athlete second or whether or not some of this stuff is happening as a result of box ticking and enforced compliance yeah and i think i mean realistically and from quite a lot and varied involvement in sport it's mostly going to be box ticking mm. because people like shiny gold things more than they like people and shiny gold things bring money as well and they don't complain that much <laughs> like we've got loads of shiny gold things that sound like all your athletes are depressed yeah, but these are shiny so yeah yeah it's, yeah it, it's what are our priorities here really yeah but I suppose logically, if people are happy, mm. they'll perform better. Not always. No? No. So sometimes if people are happy, they're not motivated to perform because they're not motivated to prove anything. Uh, yeah. No, well, yeah, in extreme sports as well, people tend to do the craziest stuff after a breakup because... Mm doesn't matter anymore yeah yeah and they don't have to worry about yeah. someone else yeah and they're angry potentially yeah. 
so not everyone in sport is motivated to do it for unhealthy reasons i accept <laughs> that there are a lot of people there's like three of them who are in it. <laughs> yeah there's a few in the country in the whole country there's a few people that do it just because they enjoy it um no i i just never get to meet those people unfortunately i'd love to meet them you know yeah i suppose your <laughs> exposure is through the nature of what you're dealing with yeah. is with people who yeah. are on some level have an issue that they need to do exactly with. so my exposure is to people that are motivated to do well in sport because of their developmental history which means that something has happened where they're engaging in sport for a reason yeah and they may need to be externally validated that they're good enough yeah um release some aggression because it's socially acceptable but outside of sport they can't release that aggression yeah um you know we explore it in the book don't we there's there's all sorts of motivations why people engage in sport but again that's probably why a lot of coaches don't necessarily like referring to me because if i work with those people that are motivated to do well in sport for those <laughs> yes. reasons our athletes are really happy but they're much worse yes. yeah they're like well thanks for the happy athlete amy but they're not performing now is you know because they don't care <laughs> is there anything we can do to sadden yeah. them up a bit yeah, yes exactly <laughs> can we make them more angry you know i've got an athlete who's got loads of potential but they're just so damn happy yes exactly exactly <laughs> what have you done <laughs> some trauma you can deal uh -huh. with like yeah. this yeah i mean we joke about it but it, it's it's so true yeah you know? it's easy to joke that but realistically they may be reluctant for you to see someone just in case yeah yeah and the athlete themselves can often be reluctant because they kind of know on some level that if you mess about with this i i might lose my edge yeah and the majority of athletes that we're talking with donna moore this morning that on some level you are selfish you have to be selfish yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. and if you make people less selfish mm. then they might go out with their mates instead of training or they might do this or yeah. you know the things that in life that you put aside to be an athlete mm. if they start creeping in then yeah. you might be less good as an athlete maybe it it might mean that well this is the debate isn't it so it might mean that you don't get as much sleep because you've gone out late it might yeah. mean that your nutrition is knocked off a bit because you've gone out for a nice meal um so it might impact in that way um but i always argue like in a recent instagram post i did the tower versus the pyramid yeah and and i always argue that actually though if you can get a pyramid where you have got sport hobbies other stuff you are going to deliver a, a good human you know yeah <laughs> and, that, and that's what that's what i'm all about i i want people to be good healthy happy humans um yeah rather than sport 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 in a tower yeah that's what i've sort of started to come across through the people I've chatted to doing this is uh -huh. they want to be known as more than this athlete. Oh, that's interesting. Okay. Yeah, it's weird because I speaking to an Olympic weightlifter I know and she said, I, yeah, I'm an Olympic weightlifter, but mm -hmm. I also do this and people don't care about that. Oh, but I do this yeah. and I do this and people should yeah. So, oh no, you're just an athlete. So you... They are people. Like yeah, people are people. Yeah. That's such a lovely thing that you're doing then. These podcasts are giving athletes the opportunity to show the whole of their personality and their story. Yeah, that's why it's as you can probably tell, entirely unscripted. Yes. Massively unplanned. Uh -huh. It's just what story people want to come out and what they want people to know about them. Yeah, that's great. Because otherwise just look on Wikipedia. You can find out yeah. what someone's done. Yeah, yeah. But knowing why they've done it. And mm. then, you know, if people can take something from an episode, whether it's, you know, you say, like, if you're feeling depressed, these are the routes you can mm -hmm. go down. Mm -hmm. If someone 
feels depressed and they feel a bit lost with it mm. they now know there's two routes they can go down yeah. the, there's loads of routes but knowing that they exist yeah, yeah. and you know speaking to uh, Jenny Todd who's an amazing strong woman and coach and she said I, I just didn't fit in anywhere and then I found strong woman which is a group of people who don't fit in and we all don't fit in together and it's brilliant yeah. and the yeah. yeah sport just gives people that opportunity to yeah you you have a base level connection with someone you do absolutely and you know I I'm really concerned that because of the nature of what I do people will think that I hate sport <laughs> I, I really don't <laughs> You know, I, I love sport. It's given me a lot, you know. I think I think the message I want to get across is that sport's incredible. You know, community, like you say, groups. I mean, goodness, rowing for me was my family. You know, yeah. that, that was the support network and they continue to be my friends. And um, and I'm looking forward to, you know, I, I'll go paddle boarding and my old rowing partner will swim and that's what we're going to do next and we'll, we'll do that together. And... Um, it's it's more about trying to get the message across that it's how we relate to ourselves which then defines how we relate to sport and if we relate to ourselves in a healthy way we'll relate to our sport in a healthy way and in that way sport's going to be an incredible thing yeah it sort of sounds like you just hate sport (laughs) (laughs) thanks (laughs) Tom. yeah definitely really against sport yeah hate it (laughs) beautiful <laughs> lyrical prose about the benefits of sport so, no no she can't she can't actually like it what um what did you do as a rower you've said you're a lightweight rower but were you in were you quad were you pairs like yeah by yourself or yeah do rowers <laughs> do everything um, well, I, I guess like the the really good ones specialise, but I I, I just, <laughs> just any. I just kind of got put in a boat. But um, <laughs> um, so just thumbing a lift yeah, on the yeah, side of a just river. Just like Amy going that one today. Okay. Okay. Yeah. What's this? Yeah. yeah. Sure. What am what I holding? Just, uh, <laughs> just row. Okay. Sound. Yeah. I've got it. <laughs> Um, I think I even coxed at one point, which is hysterical, really. You what? Know? <laughs> what do coxes? What's the point in the cox? Oh no, the co- ooh, ooh. not like from a oh damn. Because I like, I like, I love sport. God, Dan hates rowing. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I love row, like I love watching the rowing, but on a practical sense, from an outsider's point of view, you've just put some more weight in a boat. <laughs> right. it doesn't help the boat go that way no it does so the cox steers the boat you know that right no ah uh, okay so the cox steers the boat so they have i'm doing this as if so in the boat they have um i don't even know the words <laughs> like the the like rudder yeah. they have um they're steering the boat and they're also shouting at the team telling them what to do you're going backwards in a boat so yeah so you don't know where you are so the cox lets you know when you need to push harder when you just need to hold or when you need to push through so it's part of the motivational narrative but it's also part of the technical narrative in terms of responding to where you are um alongside the other competitors in the field because you don't know what's going on behind you i I apologize to coxes everywhere (laughs) take it back you I hate just, coxes. You know? God, he hates coxes. <laughs> I just, from the outside, it just seems like there's yeah. someone extra in a boat. No. But they're actually no. doing... Yeah. So oh, okay. if, if you row on a tidal river as well, oh, you need a cox. Because they, they read the water as well in terms of the swell, the tide. No so way. they are navigating the boat around the river and they will also make calls for stroke side to go harder or bow side to go harder so that you can navigate the the, the fastest route for competition, but also the safest no route so you're not clashing blades with other crews. Yeah, I suppose I just assume that rowing's in a straight line. <laughs> 
but right. it's sort of broadly a straight line uh-huh. that doesn't want to be straight. Yeah, well, so it's, it's typically a straight line for sprint season, but for long distance, you know, if you look at so Oxford Cambridge boat race, yeah, 5k round a, a hugely tidal river, too many, that, too many yeah. blinds to row. Well, yeah, it's painful, yeah. Yeah, I think, I mean, the, I did 23k once to see how bad it was. Oh, on a rowing machine? Yeah, a yeah. half marathon. How'd really. you find that? It's upsetting. <laughs> I did it in a public gym as well, like a normal gym, oh, wow. leisure centre gym. And the guy, there was a guy PTing on the machine next to me. Okay. And he finished and then came back with another client oh. and I was still there. Yeah. How long did that take you? I want to say like 58 minutes or something. Oh wow! Like, that, for twenty three kilometers. I'm sure. No. I'll, I'll find out. It's on social media somewhere. That that's pretty impressive. <laughs> yeah, I I'm feel sure like you should be in the Olympics. Stan, what I'll do like, is very professionally uh, get do, your phone out. Yeah, Joe Rogan does it. It's fine. Oh, uh, yeah, d- yeah, yeah. acceptable then. Yeah. Uh, do you want me to just look over here? Or yeah, you chat here? chat yeah, once yourself, which okay. is tricky when there's one. Yeah, <laughs> Um, what was it? Oh God, social media is awful. Isn't it? Um, for people listening on a podcast, I'm just uh, scrolling on my phone trying to see how long it took me to do a horrific row. Uh, oh no, that was totally wrong. Yeah. That was one of my splits. Yeah. <laughs> An hour 42. Yeah, okay, that makes more sense. <laughs> That's the one. That makes more sense. I remember yeah. it being terrible. What did I do? I did something up like a 58 minute row because I was buzzing it was below an hour. But I tend to see people do something and think, I wonder how bad that was. Oh, okay. So go and have a go at it. Okay. And at the CrossFit Games, they did a half marathon row. And I was like, wow. Well, well, yeah, how bad can that be it's just really rowing bad. yeah really bad turns out it's terrible yeah really bad rowing's really yeah. bad for you yeah. <laughs> it's really not yeah. fun yeah no it, it's a tough sport it prides itself on that but yeah do you ever look at people and think I wonder how good that is and then do that yeah like <laughs> I want to you just look at people and think how bad is that how, like, I, I want to feel how bad that is <laughs> how awful was that experience <laughs> Uh-huh. So, uh, John Clark, who I'm going to chat to at some point, he's currently doing 48 marathons in 48 counties. Okay. I think in 48 days. Okay. Too many marathons. Wow. And there's a part of me that's consistently talking myself out of trying to run a marathon mm. with just to pop out and see how bad it is. Mm. It's like, people run marathons all the time. Yeah, what? How, like, how bad can that be? Like, it can't be that, yeah. like... Yeah. People run it dressed as like lizards and dinosaur <laughs> costumes. Uh huh. Uh-huh. Like, it can't be that bad. But then there's the other part of me that's seen the picture of his feet, and it's oh no, it's probably really awful. Okay. That's okay. Probably I thought you were gonna time. say I've seen his feet and I want those feet. And no, no. I was, no. Go- I was, I was gonna like, get oh, really no, that can't concerned. be good. Like yeah. it's yeah. But no, it's a weird. Like rowing is awful though. <laughs> so impressive to watch. Uh-huh. But like all my clients will have at least a phase of like four by five hundred with a minute off, or mm-hmm. like various uh, like sets of a hundred meters with short rest, mm-hmm. or do a two k every few months to see where their fitness is at. Mm-hmm. Like these are fit people, yeah, like they're good athletes. And they're like, oh, this is awful. This yeah. is unacceptable. <laughs> Yeah. Well, look, there's a butterfly in the room. Have you noticed that? Oh, nice. That's, that's quite nice, isn't it? Sorry, distracted. <laughs> yeah, no, it is. It is. And what's even worse is when rowing really tells you how you're doing as well because you've got the numbers right in front of you. It is, like, it's there. And you can yeah. watch it as well, uh, yeah. which is... Yeah, go up and down. Every time you pull a stroke. You can, yeah. Yeah, and yeah. I constant feedback. Get to the point where I'm like... If I'm doing 2K, I'm like, right, there's 100 metres left. That's 10 big pulls. But 10 metres of pull with a little bit of coast. It's like, that's only 10 big pulls. You can do that. And then one of them might not be big enough. And you're like, no, it's it's 11. There's, yeah. No one can do 11. <laughs> like, yeah, this is yeah. impossible. Yeah. 
you're like, no, I've got to pull yeah. harder. It's yeah. got to be ten. Yeah, mentally, it's it's yeah, it's tough. You've you've got to be talking to yourself quite a lot. Would <laughs> as like rowers when you're testing and stuff. Mm. Do because I want this. I would want to see it. I'd want a result. I think. Mm. Like, do you have the screen down to? know what's going on I I started to put the screen down when I became quite bad at rowing (laughs) because I didn't want to see it anymore the numbers really hurt (laughs) so I just kind of knocked it down then it's the best coping mechanism it's avoidance I know oh my god what have I done I've just suggested that I'm avoidant Um, so (laughs) how did it make you feel yeah terrible (laughs) really terrible um but no, I used to watch the numbers like yeah. everything. But it was a, it was a measure of how that test was going. You know, you knew what splits you had to be hitting for your two K test. Would you bail on a test if it wasn't going to plan? No. Just... Did you have the option to do that? Like, if you if you were meant to be pulling like a one thirty split throughout, mm. and one of your first split you foot slipped or something or something went wrong and you pulled like 155 would you just sack the test off and go again or did you have to it's a good question i don't know but in my head there was no way it was stopping so if once the test starts that's it that's it you you commit to it yeah absolutely you get it done yeah so it's about testing almost testing your willingness to work rather than exactly what the numbers say yeah you knew when the tests were and right. the tests were were a crucial part of the training program for monitoring um it was part of the trial as well to get into the squad you know you had to do the tests and then that would dictate what seat you would get in the boat um, wow so it really was yeah that was it yeah what was um Where's the best place to be in a boat? Where's like where you want to be? <laughs> Cox, do nothing. Do you, like, <laughs> Just shout, steer a bit. It's fine. Right, okay. Oh, God. I like coxes, okay? I'm just saying. Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> okay, they are a good part of that boat, all right? But their 2K time doesn't have to be great. No, no. They're but, another one, though, that weight-wise, they have to be very low for weight. I suppose, because they're not propelling the boat exactly the yeah the the better yeah exactly so where's yeah. the prime seat the prime seat in a boat oh well people will argue differently for this i'll see if i can remember it oh my god it's such a long time ago so um if we're talking an eight yeah okay so we'll talk Just eight. A, a number of people in a boat <laughs> number of people in a boat so we'll talk eight so we've got a cox yeah. And then you've got the first two at the front, so that is stroke and number seven. So, when you say the front, in direction of travel, it's the back. Oh yeah, of course, I always but, forget this. Yeah. Yeah, just so yeah. people understand that yeah. the front of a boat is the furthest away from the Yes, yeah, so that's the line. bow. So the bow is the one that crosses the water first, but there, yeah. yeah. So I, that is number one, actually, bow at the back. But I see right. them at the back. Because the, the two at the front, which sits in front of the cocks, they're kind of required to set the rhythm. Right. So everybody has to follow them in terms of rhythm. That's also what the cocks does. This is bringing it back to me. It mm-hmm. sets the pace. It sets, it sets how many strokes per minute we should be doing. Okay. okay. So if it's a long race, the first percentage might be... A- like yep. 30 and then drop down to 25 up to 30 well, obviously the numbers yeah. will be a start you're probably looking at about you know 40 40 plus strokes per minute to get the boat going and then you'll yeah. settle into a certain rate um, so they'll make sure that you're at the right rate um, so the stroke will set the the pace but will yeah. also technically set the boat up because that's what everybody follows so in terms of um, speed on the slide um that's that's important um and then the four in the middle are considered the powerhouse so so they're considered the the guys that are you know or the girls that are doing all the hard work so they want the best 2k time 
the strongest, the kind of, you know, well, we would do 2K tests, but we'd also do seat racing on the water. So they'd move us around in different seats and then they'd test how, how long that piece took. And then we'd do it again in different okay. seats. And so they'd do that as well to see how the boat set up differently with different people in different seats. Yeah, that, yeah. it makes a lot of sense. Uh, on paper, this is the best setup, but yeah. let's mix it up and yeah, see. Yeah. People yeah. jowl and how yeah. stuff moves. Because it's not always just what can you pull on an ergo. It's it's how does that translate in the boat as well. Yeah. You know, because technically it's it's a different skill to you know generate power through water. So it's yeah yeah yeah. yeah I remember trying <laughs> at school. We had and we very rarely got to use it because we had like a proper rowing team, mm. and there was the rest of us that did like indoor rowing. But they had like one of the water. Oh yes, herbs. yeah, like, yeah, you, yeah. Like reasonably, at the time, thought reasonably decent at rowing, mm-hmm. and then you get on the thing that simulates being on an mm-hmm. actual boat. Mm-hmm. Like, mm-hmm. This doesn't make any sense. Yeah, yeah. Well, there's so many other variables and factors that you're working with as well. You know, yeah. you have to balance the boat as well. Yeah, there's no point having. A load of really heavy strong guys on one side no no and i think that's where sometimes rowing is misunderstood that you've just got a hoof a boat down the river technically it it's very precise in terms of setting the boat up so that you get a good run on it and it's yeah. balanced because obviously if it's not balanced you then create drag with the blades on top of the water yeah so um technically you it's got to be um correct as well um so coming back to your point in where to sit on the in the boat, you've then got two at the back and they tend to be your kind of lighter athletes at the front front back of the boat. Um, because the that they're the ones that are, you know, you'd want I so think you want your boat nose to be up a bit. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay. Where um where did you where was your <laughs> spot? Well, no, it, I've got to tell. You've it got kind, to yeah. tell the best bit. Where was. Yeah. It kind of it kind of depended what boat I was in. Um, I did stroke, stroke the seat look, it sounds terrible. I did stroke the boat a lot, not physically stroke the boat, you know, <laughs> really like, yeah, 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 really love the boat. Um, but I, I did sit at the front quite a bit yeah. to set the rhythm. Um, probably because also I wasn't, um, physiologically that probably was one of the better places for me because I wasn't one of the beasts in the middle but similarly I wasn't probably one of the lightest sometimes I'd sit at the back of one of the lighter ones but um at university um it varied a bit but then in a pair um when you haven't got a cox I would sit at the front to set the rhythm and stroke the boat because also that meant that I could get out of steering because my rowing partner at the back then had to steer with her foot which what? was attached to the rudder so I got out of That's that fucking mental yeah. yeah so yeah. rowing yeah. quite hard yeah like putting quite a bit of effort in uh-huh. yeah. and then you've got to yeah steer you've got to steer with your foot so yeah with a like a rowing machine concept to mm-hmm. uh, whatever you want to call it uh-huh. feet are strapped in yeah is it the same setup but one of them steers yes. the boat yeah exactly yeah that's insane yeah yeah i didn't like that job i was terrible at it because you have to look round a lot to see where you're going so that can then offset the balance so of course yes yeah. So yeah. you're shifting weight yeah that yeah and then turn the boat that you've got to turn yeah. against but yeah also row yeah 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 coxes are useful isn't it yeah, like, wow. <laughs> there you go. I mean, there someone you go. else do that. So okay. Loads better. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Because yeah, yeah, it does my head in when my feet move on the footplates. Yes. And I'm indoors and I uh-huh. don't have to steer. Yeah. And it's I can't sink or tip over. Or, yeah. Uh huh. Yeah, that is mad. That's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so it's been like an hour and a half. Oh wow, that's so. Long. Well, Do you think people will listen to an hour and a half? Who knows? It's quite a long time. It's ages, isn't it? Yeah, but it's quite long. It's, <laughs> when I first sort of was thinking about doing this, the mulligans who have been like so much help, yeah. it's about, if you end up at like three hours, then it might be worth thinking about splitting it. Right. Uh-huh. And I was like, who talks for three <laughs> hours? Who's got that much to say? And then the first um, one, I was like, an hour and a half in, I was like, 
Yeah. Oh, this is uh-huh. like, people are really interesting. And once like you get chatting, I think because it's not structured, mm. mm-hmm. it can just disappear on a tangent, okay. and then you go, "Oh no, I still want to talk about this thing." Uh huh. So this story might go this way, then you've got to yeah. like loop it back. But on the way back, you might go, "Oh, but we could go this way." Yeah. Yeah. And it, yeah, like some of these episodes will be, yeah, really long. Yeah, but that's okay. But I like that stuff. That's the organic nature of stuff, isn't it? Yeah, because yeah. conversations last ages. Yeah, yeah that's great. Yeah. That's why I want to travel around and do it yeah. or have yeah. a studio eventually. Wow, right. you want a studio eventually? Yeah. You're going big on this. this yeah. Is, if, yeah. Essentially, if it, if it gets to a point where it, can, it doesn't cost me money, then I'll keep travelling around indefinitely. Good for you. If it gets to the point where it makes money, I'll get a studio and well, good have for a you. proper setup. And I hope you get that. Yeah, it'd be cool. It's That'd be awesome. Transitions perfectly into make sure you like, comment, and subscribe, click the bell, all of that stuff. <laughs> I've learned to just say that randomly. <laughs> okay. Just... We haven't even spoken about Strongman, Dan. That's weird, isn't it? That's no. how we met. Yeah, which. It's really, well, I mean, this is the first time we've met. Faced, yeah. like, physically. We've, we've met, we should probably say virtually, a number of times. Yeah, and Zoom is weird, because I'm, yeah. I'm always on my phone, sat in a window chair, trying to balance my phone on a flower pot. Uh-huh. And then you sort of say, oh, can you just get the date for this? I'm like, yeah. how can I... Be on my phone without uh-huh. looking. Yeah. Because <laughs> yeah. otherwise I'll just hold it here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But yeah, it's um in fact we'll just carry on a bit because really? we should talk about strongman. Are, are you sure? Like with the time and stuff, you're good. Should we yeah, just go with it? Yeah, because <laughs> realistically, a lot of people will find this through strongman. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah. A lot of people or a new range of people will know who you are because of strongman. Or like a new audience. Have you? Why strongman? <laughs> <laughs> Why strongman? <laughs> because it, it's not, it's not that long ago that well the first time I was fortunate enough to go to World's Strongest Man with someone I was coaching. People took the Mickey and assumed we're a couple because why would you take a bloke with you? Like you can get a free ticket for your partner or whatever. And he just went. Because he's my coach and I'm a professional athlete wow. at the biggest comp. That was like two or three years ago. I was going to say, how long ago was that? That yeah, was two or three not years long ago. ago. People didn't have coaches. You'd wow. have a, you'd have someone to help you out. Oh my goodness! But like proper coaching, nutrition in strongman is new. Yeah, yeah. Like yeah, and it's there's been a few people like Brian Shaw was working with nutritionists for ages, but people thought he was just a bit weird. Really? Yeah, because all you do, you just eat loads. Just eat loads of food, take loads of gear, that's it. Wow. Simple. You don't need science, mm. don't need coaching. Mm. And I've been saying that since you've started working with, because I've been working with Tom for a couple of years, but mm. I think we sort of started working, you might have been working with Luke before I was, I think. I think I was like 10 weeks before Worlds actually yeah. working mm, that's interesting so I was quite soon after Bahrain yeah I wasn't coaching Luke anywhere near Bahrain were you not? no nope. oh wow I didn't know that yeah we had like 8 to 10 weeks before Worlds that was it oh get ready for next year right? yeah so it was <laughs> a bit hectic because I'd worked with Tom for a couple of years and you like Luke didn't really have coaches mm-hmm. and he was like we've discussed this with some guy who lifts heavy stuff yeah that's entirely doing them a disservice isn't it as a sport yeah it's a yeah and I've been saying like since we since I was introduced to you as a concept which is a mad sentence to say but <laughs> I I'm think, a concept <laughs> I couldn't think of another way to put it <laughs> I've like said it open like on other podcasts I like, psychology and strongman is going to be yeah. the next thing it'll be yeah. everyone needs a coach everyone needs a nutritionist and the majority of you are pretty tapped 
in some way talk to a psychologist. Yeah. Yeah. And so why did, what drew you into Strongman? Well, <laughs> I, I, I don't know how to say this. Um, so I'm not into strongman training myself. <laughs> so yeah. so um, I like weight training. Yeah. I've always done weight training. As part of rowing, you, you have to do weight training. Um, but it was, so I met Luke years ago in a gym because I was still doing weight training for rowing. Okay. And he was working on the rigs at the time um, and was accessing that gym whilst he was away. So it was actually in Newcastle that we met, in a gym in Newcastle. What gym was it? Oh, DW at the time, DW Sports or something. Okay, because Donna might have been around there as well. Oh, really? Yeah, because she, wow. her first ever comp was with Luke. Like, oh, they've trained wow. Luke's first ever comp as well, like their first. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. So yeah, it's, it's such a massive sport, but so small. Yeah. So you met Luke as, yeah. and I assume that was full big dafty from the Highlands mode of at Luke. that stage, at that stage, yes. Yeah. Um, but no, so just training, um, squat rack. I can remember I was squatting at the time. Squatting is big in rowing, um, yeah. and um, just got talking because we were both training, um, and then eventually. It was me that contacted him to interview him for the book. Right. So um, I'm going to name drop it here, Dan, because I can if you don't yes. mind me. So, you know, the book is skewed to the right. Available from mm. all good retailers. Absolutely. Amazon, as long as it's not sold out, or yeah. Waterstones. <laughs> it keeps on, the algorithm keeps on having to. Waterstones got it. Yeah, Waterstones. That's so cool. Yeah. That's like yeah. childhood bookshop. Yeah. Like yeah. my memories of. Yeah. <laughs> wow, it sounds depressing. But me and my mum used to go out to Waterstones oh, that's to nice. look at books. That's and, lovely. Yeah. But it's, it sounds like some Victorian upbringing. Yeah. But yeah. Off we pop to the bookshop. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I used to love looking in bookshops. Oh, that's nice. that's yeah. so cool. Yeah. So Waterstones have it. So did W. H. Smith. Can you remember W. H. Smith? Yeah. Yeah. I used to. Go in there just to read magazines. Yeah. Never bought anything. Yeah. Probably yes. not great for their business. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but yeah. it's ace. You just yeah. go. <laughs> uh-huh. Yeah. So, yeah, in all good bookstores, should we say that? Yeah. I, I Some bad yeah. ones probably as well. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> I c couldn't comment. I think they're all wonderful. <laughs> so, it's available. <laughs> it's available now. Go buy the book. <laughs> it, I'm... I suppose like a third of the way through it at the moment. Okay. I've just finished uh, a chapter on masochism, which oh yeah, intense that one. Yeah, it's pretty yeah, heavy. Yeah, it's but heavy going. I'd on. say that's about a third of the way through. Yeah, yeah. And it yeah. is super interesting. Thank you. Like it, I tried <laughs> to read it during Worlds. That was a mistake. <laughs> No, we had a different focus there, yeah. Dad. No, we, I was yeah. like, oh, I've got a new book. I'll start this. Yeah, like, yeah. There's so many words. <laughs> <laughs> what do any of them mean? Dan, it's meant to be really accessible. I want it to be... <laughs> now I'm reading it, okay. not dealing with World's Strongest Man. Yeah. You find yourself Very dealing with concepts. Yeah. That yeah. You sort of look back at what you've read and understood and think, I didn't think I'd understand this. Like, it's really interesting, and it's not about strongman. It might have a strongman on the front. Yes, it does. Oh, <laughs> that was very kind of him, smart wasn't Smart marketing. It? Yeah. Really good. <laughs> <laughs> I, I took that photo. Did you know I took that I photo? I did not know you took that. Yeah, about. yeah, I took that photo. I do a bit of photography. It wasn't oh, just cool. like, oh, I'm taking my smartphone up. But yeah, I did do that photo. Yeah, and Luke was kind enough to, yeah offer which was just incredible yeah, yeah. so yeah. the book will sort of this is what the tangents yeah yeah so the book is about clinical psychology and the other one that i can't remember how to say psychodynamic psychotherapy that one yes yeah amongst athletes from like so many different sports and i don't want to say 
like Nigel Owens is an incredible athlete, but he's not an athlete, if that makes it like. No, but he's in the sporting world. Yeah, so it's within a variety of people. And he did play rugby before he became a referee. I did not know that. It makes sense. Yeah. But I didn't know that. Yeah. He's one of my favourite. I'd go as far as to say he's in my top five favourite rugby players who and he doesn't play rugby or favourite parts of rugby it's testament to him isn't it and he's not a rugby player he's a referee but he's such a big personality and so well known within the well rugby community and beyond yeah he's a household name there's so many compilations on YouTube of like you know footballers versus rugby players Mm. and I just remember I was a kid and I'd, I'd recently met Martin Johnson and at the time my dad was the biggest person I'd ever seen and then I met him with Martin Johnson and realised my dad's like a large child <laughs> and there's like all these Leicester Tigers players and they're so big mm. and you know like now I'm dealing with strong men you realise that I was going to say is this where the fascination with strong men like maybe we'll yeah. go full well, full analysis yeah let's let's explore that but <laughs> then I saw Nigel Owens who's mm. comparatively he looks like he's about five foot tall and weighs about eight stone mm. mm-hmm. I think realistically he's not like he's athletic he worked out mm-hmm. but yeah. you see these guys who this is a period of rugby as well where so long as only two people were fighting, they were allowed to fight. Like, you wouldn't break up wow. two people going at it. On the pitch, during yeah, the yeah, game? Yeah, you've got something to settle, deal with it. Wow, okay. If it wasn't like, you know, like hockey fighting, mm. where they have an enforcer, which is a wild concept. Like, you could start a fight, but these your enforcers will fight. Yeah. You're not allowed to hit other players, but yeah. these two guys can go at it. And that was sort of a thing in rugby. And like there were still like working men. I know Jason Leonard worked in like a steel factory mm. whilst playing for England, mm-hmm, which is mm-hmm. nuts. It shouldn't have ever been a thing. But you know, they're hard men. They're big. They're in big air quotes, like manly men. Yeah. And then this seemingly tiny bloke tells them off. And then pushing their big toe into the floor and apologising and walk off. Yeah. And that's just like... Yeah. To me, that's what rugby was and what rugby is. Like, it's a Mm. pure respect thing. Yeah. And he just fascinates me. And I'm, like, excited to read through the book. Yeah, yeah. I was tempted to flick ahead. Yeah, do it. Do it. No. You don't want to. You You want to follow them. You wrote it in a way. Like, it's laid out in a way. That's interesting. I don't want to... Yeah. Start dealing with something and then <laughs> Oh God. <Yeah. laughs> oh no. <laughs> this is where we're going next. <laughs> well, it's um no, it's an incredible book and really interesting to like everyone should like I mean everyone should buy it. <laughs> Hopefully they'll read it's it my, as well, you know. I think it is <laughs> Who was it? Richard Ayawadi, the comedian. Oh yes, I yeah. Advertising I really like his book and he said you know, why should people read your book? He goes, I don't care. Everyone should buy my book <laughs> and then make a decision whether you want to read it or not. <laughs> See, I quite like people to buy it to read it. Yeah. So, so, <laughs> so I really like Richard Ayoade. I think he's great. But um, I'd really like people to buy it to read it because yeah. the, the reason that I did it was all about increasing awareness and, yeah. and getting people to think about who the humans are yeah, behind the sport. Especially relevant after the last weekend. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Where, I mean, fundamentally, some people are evil. That's what, that's my takeaway from the mm. behaviour of English football fans yeah. recently is, yeah. you know, these people are not good people. It's really disturbing, isn't it? And... Uh, it, you know, we've just spoken about the good things in sport, that it's meant to be about community and bringing people together. Yeah. Um, and supporting 
a shared goal, but then respecting the opposition as well. Respecting and, your own team. Well, yeah. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I think it's so important to understand that athletes aren't this myth, mythical no. breed. No. They're people who are no. way more determined than most other people. Mm. Super dedicated, obsessed, mm. masochist, mm. all of this. <laughs> but fundamentally, they are people. Yeah. And you wouldn't, if you went to the bank and someone made a fairly basic error, yeah. you wouldn't threaten to kill them or beat no. up people no. from the other bank. Or abuse them or denigrate them. Or you, of course you wouldn't. So why is it okay with. I know. Well, yeah. it's not. That, that's the whole no. point, right? <laughs> that, that was the whole point. It's not okay. But at the moment, we've got um, platforms that continue to suggest it's okay. Yeah. I think when I was speaking to Donna Moore, the phrase that came up was... What did I say? I think it's become more socially acceptable to tell sexists to piss off. Mm. It hasn't got rid of sexism. It's not changed the fundamental issue. Mm -hmm but it's now okay to call people out on it. Mm -hmm. Which I think is step one. Mm -hmm. I think that's how stuff progresses. Mm -hmm. But for some reason, football just has, it's just lads, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Oh, it's just lads, it's just laddish behavior. It's like, no, it's actual racism yeah. and yeah. obvious violence. Yeah. But five arrests have been made, right, since then? Yeah, through like LinkedIn and Twitter and really? stuff. Really? Yeah. That, to me, I, I don't know, I, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but that's progression, right? Yeah, I think so. I think the fact that... The fact that it exists is horrific. Mm. But the fact that on some level there's a removal of this curtain of internet... I can't say the word. I'm going to try Anonymity. Anonymity. Yeah, tough yeah. word. Yeah, yeah. Like too it many is, ends. Yeah. yeah. Just less yeah, ends. And exactly. Be because I mean, there's been five arrests, but there yeah. were there were I mean, what thousands, thousands of you know. So why are there not thousands? Yeah. Of arrests. And it's it's just nuts because athletes are people. Yeah. And mm -hmm. people make mistakes. Yeah. And I feel like taking a penalty at Wembley mm. in a final mm. you could class that as a high pressure situation of course like it's yes. not <laughs> oh my word yeah but, oh I wouldn't have missed that so yeah. take oh, yeah. it then go and take yeah. it go, go and do Let's, that yeah exactly and you said about making mistakes I don't even know whether they made a mistake they tried their best and they did what they thought yeah. was appropriate at that time in order to deliver the result that they hoped for, yeah. but other factors and variables meant that that didn't happen. That doesn't make them a bad person. It doesn't make them um, lacking in skill. It no. makes them an athlete and a human. Um, the more acceptable or proper way of looking at it is, bloody hell, that Italian goalkeeper did well. Exactly. Yeah. That's not mentioned. Yeah. Like, exactly. Yeah. But if we'd have won, yeah. Then yeah. You know, it's easy to yeah. But yeah, people are. Do you know that's a really good point? Because I mean, I don't know statistically in penalty shootouts how how often are three saved? I don't know, but he has done like that. He was a good goalkeeper. Yeah. And yeah. he'd had the entire match after he let a goal in. Mm. There was like ninety odd minutes where. He only touched the ball twice again through the whole match. Wow. So he genuinely made a mistake. Right. Or, you know, was beaten by an mm -hmm. England player, mm -hmm. whatever happened. Mm -hmm. And then he didn't have to touch the ball again. Right. And then he saved three penalties. So he's clearly good at his job. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And the England keeper yeah. was also good again, at his job. Very good at his job. <laughs> and saved two. They right? were, yeah. And they're playing in quite an elite competition exactly so they're probably not bad at their yeah. job because yeah. you don't just get in the final <laughs> yeah. huge pressure it's not some bloke no. it's not like I can't remember what the film was but oh we need a goalkeeper and mm -hmm. someone comes out of the crowd mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. like their job is to do this yeah. and to attack someone for doing their job as oh. well as they can 
Yeah, exactly. It's just crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Not acceptable. So strong man. <laughs> strong man. Let's go back to strong you, man. So you yeah. Met Luke, yeah. Interviewed him for the book. Yes. Was that purely for the book, if that makes sense? Yes, it was purely for the book at that stage. So yeah. no kind of working psychological kind of relationship. Everyone that I've interviewed for the book, I should make clear, not one of them has been a patient. Okay, so it is pure interview, yes, research exactly. sort of stuff. Yeah, so, and that's really important to say because working with patients, it's a confidential environment. It's yeah. not that I would ever put that in a book. Yeah. So these are all athletes that I've interviewed with them in full knowledge that they're being interviewed for a book and then wrote the uh, chapter and then sent them the chapter and then collaborated together in terms of any changes to make sure that they were happy with the contents as well. So, wow. yeah, this, so this wasn't media sensationalist kind of writing, this was look, we had a shared agenda of saying we need to talk about mental health in sport. Yeah. So let's work together to share your story and wow. increase understanding. So I wanted them to feel entirely comfortable with what was in the book. Yeah, which is more than fair. Yeah, because absolutely. Because they yeah. spoke to you very frankly in some cases. Yeah. So you yeah. don't want to... It's the same as I've said doing this. It's not about ambushing people. No, no. It's no, not no. like some journalism. You no. want to yeah. Yeah. actually help people as well exactly. and understand. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Did you, and I suppose you can't really go too much into it because of what it is, but did you have to make many changes? Like, were there things afterwards where people were like, I should not have said that? Uh, no, not many at all. That's good. Then. Like, it shows yeah. that it is just open. and. Yeah, yeah. And I think a lot of them, actually, as much as it wasn't therapy... A lot of um, the people in the book spoke to me afterwards and said that they, they found it quite cathartic in some ways. Actually yeah. having an experience where someone was interested and it allowed them to think as well um, and hear my thoughts on the matter as well. And they thought, oh, that's interesting. Haven't considered that. Um, so I think as a process, um, I've had feedback from a few that they found it quite helpful as well, which is nice. And that's really helpful. cool. Yeah. Yeah, it's sort yeah. of almost justifies their involvement on yeah, a deeper level yeah because because i should say that you know everybody generously donated their time for free for that yeah. project because there was a shared goal and agenda to increase awareness and understanding yeah that, that's what's behind this there's there's nothing else behind it um and it's you know it's incredible that these people are out there that want to do that yeah and it is it's real because they're not getting paid for it they're not trying to the agenda is honest conversation about mental health. There's yeah. no other yeah. agenda to move things. Yeah. So where do you, again, like obviously working with like Luke and Tom, you can't really go into certain things, but do you think in the broad spectrum of strongman, the psychological or like help or analysis is something people should look at? Or at what stage do you think they should look at it? Oh, that's a huge question. Um, so, we've just been talking about this this morning. So, psychoanalysis, I believe, can be helpful for everyone. <laughs> yeah. um, it, it allows you to look at what may be unconsciously driving you. So, the question of why is a tough question for a lot of sports people. Why do you do it? And yeah. they may be able to give you a, a, a surface kind of answer of, well, I, I think I enjoy it or I like winning. or yeah. But analysis would allow you to look at what might be some of the unconscious motivators. Yeah, so I do it because I enjoy it, but then you're looking at why do they enjoy that? Yeah. And why have they yeah. sought out? Yeah. That type of yeah. enjoyment. So we can we can talk about Luke because his story is in the book. Yeah. So in terms of, you know, why Luke did it originally, he thought, you know, well, it, 
it was something that initially he started doing in the gym and he was quite good at and then he rocked up at Scotland's strongest man without really preparing for it and and he did he did all right yeah and he thought oh okay so maybe I can do well at this um but then when he continued to compete and we started to talk about what was driving it there's there's a whole story about Luke's family background um, his Polish prisoner of war grandfather that yeah. came over and was given asylum in the Highlands um, after World War Two. What a mad place to end up as well. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's so such a wild place to just yeah. appear. Yeah. And but also a place where for someone that has been traumatized can keep their head down. Yeah and just kind of do the job, do it well. And this is, this is definitely something that Luke's grandfather did. He, he was known in the community. This is all in the book. I just want to state that this isn't breaching any confidentiality. Yeah. Um, he kept his head down, he did his job well, and he looked after the community and people in the community. But his job was pretty much just lugging around heavy peats yeah. in the Highlands. Um, but he was then a role model for what a strong man is. You know, this is yeah. a man that has gone through a traumatic past, has written a book. Do you know that Luke's granddad no. has written a book? So Luke's wow. grand, yeah. So Luke's granddad has written a book called "Trust Me, You Will Survive." I'm gonna try and find that book. Then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've got a copy of it, of it later. Oh, right. I can show you um, if you're interested. Um, but it tells his story of um, wow. his experience of war um, and being a prisoner of war. Um, and that as a historical sort of family narrative, some people may disagree as an analyst. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's going to influence you. Yeah, um, it seems obvious that it would. Of course it would, yeah. Yeah. There's, there's a narrative of adversity. There's a narrative of strength. There's, it's a different cultural approach to life as well. It's not just sitting back and saying, well, I deserve this, I deserve that. It's actually, wow, I'm, I'm incredibly fortunate to be alive. I'm going to make the most of this. Yeah. But I'm also aware that bad things happen and I need to survive and I need yeah. to be prepared for that. So it's an entirely different way of relating to yourself and the world around you. Yeah, it's um, it is fascinating. Like the whole family are just so. It makes a lot of sense when you start to understand little bits. Yeah, yeah. Everything sort of makes sense, mm -hmm. and mm. yeah, it's an incredible story. Yeah, and yeah. Then you find out his granddad wrote a book, so it's a more of a story than yeah yeah I think it's so layered and so deep that mm, mm -hmm. again it goes back to the thing where they might be professional athletes but they're people with in exactly. some cases wild yeah. stories yeah if you don't understand someone's developmental history I don't think you can understand what's motivating them to perform wow yeah and why they're doing this. Much like for you and I, if we don't understand our developmental history, how are we meant to understand why we're doing what we're doing? Yeah, it's, uh, and I don't understand why I do most <laughs> things. The, um, my favorite answer to why do you do this? So there's a climber called Warren Harding and he climbed um, uh, the wall of the early morning light, it was called, late called the Dawn Wall on El Cap. And it took them a long time mm. and they, people tried to rescue them mm. and they're like camped out in a storm 2,000 feet up this wall in Yosemite Valley and he told the rescuers to go away in no uncertain terms, mm. we don't want rescuing. Mm -hmm. And he got to the top and there's this big media storm and mm -hmm. they're like, why do you do this? Mm -hmm. I assume expecting some mm -hmm. wonderful, mm -hmm. and he just went, because we were insane and then just walked off. <laughs> so, yeah, no, fair enough. Like mm -hmm. sometimes 
Yeah. Like what that means might be much deeper, but yeah. that's why he did it. He just yeah. did it because he wanted to. Um, yeah. And one of the feedback comments actually from someone that has read the book has said that what they've enjoyed is this exploration of potentially like how creative genius that you see it in some artists that yeah. they're, they're, there's kind of some madness sometimes in creative genius you know you look at yeah. Van Gogh and what happened there and his developmental story oh, and some his... of the stuff like especially like the renaissance and classical artists mm. were most of the time entirely off the head like just there was I can't remember what cafe it was but it was some form of psychedelic drug, cocaine and coffee mm. and brandy. Wow. That okay. was there. Uh, That's a cocktail. They'd all meet up, have a few of them, write or paint. Wow. It's like, you cannot. <laughs> yeah. Like, you are on a level there. You are on, like, another level. Yeah. Yeah. And I think people who do amazing things, quite a lot of the time have got something going on. Yeah. that makes them have to do this yeah. thing yeah yeah where um sorry just my brain's going back and forth through loads of stuff and thinking about the thought of sort of evil like because you've seen that people are pretty dark and do not care and mm. as soon as they're given the word I can't say where it means you can't recognise them and the anonymity <laughs> um, they sort of just do what they want mm-hmm. so not too long ago I read uh, I cannot remember the name of the book uh, about the Sanford prison experiment and what went right. on there mm-hmm. and in the broadest slash heaviest question like do you think there is like an inherent level of sort of shitness within people or is it purely situational or mm. so we're going down a nature versus nurture debate here yeah okay well we're sort of we'll skirt on the edge of it rather than <laughs> rather than <laughs> going going left. heavy <laughs> okay um you're talking to a woman that's worked in forensics before they yeah so i used to work in high security um in Rampton Hospital. Right. Um, and I used to work with uh, individuals in the mental health ward. Um, and I spe- we're going down a tangent now, aren't we? Um, and I used to specialise in working with deaf people. <laughs> so Eventually, I, all the tangents will meet up. <laughs> will be but covered. But this might be a 12-hour we'll be, <laughs> we'll be here for 12 hours, but we'll cover everything. Um, but yeah, so I, yes, I used to, can you see that down there? Actually, forensic psychiatry. I've got a chapter in that book. Can you see no that way. one? Yeah. That is a so, thick book. As yeah, well. yeah. Just a chapter. Yeah. <laughs> on, uh, on offending in deaf people in that book. Yeah. So, um, do I think, I think that we are, there are temperaments. Yeah. There are temperaments. But I would lean on the side of developmental experience. Yeah. That would be my lean. And also because um, we now have evidence to suggest that our developmental experiences can shape how uh, structurally our brains develop. Um, and also genetically, I believe, don't quote me on that, but there's another book over there, I'm looking at my bookshelf, um, <laughs> that, that, that talks about the nature versus nurture debate, but actually how nurture influences nature. Right. Wow. Yeah. So I would lean on developmental experience. Okay. For people who don't know, because it's quite a heavy thing that happened, Mm. the Stanford Prison Experiment very basically was there was a group of people who were guards or prison officers and there was a group of people who agreed to be they agreed to be prisoners, but didn't know what for or in what context, I think. Is I don't right? know. Well, I don't know whether I know this one. So the one that we study is, oh, now is it the Milgram experiment, which is 
in the psychology um, mm. history. But I don't know the details of this one, so I'm going to have to it's lean on you. Wild. To... Okay. <laughs> so I can't. I'm, I've already used my phone once, so yeah. I'm going to do, do it again. again. It's really professional. It's yeah. what all the good uh, podcasters do. So many things that aren't the Stanford Prism experiment. So, it was influenced by the Milgram experiment. Ah, there you go, yeah. And uh, it was Philip Zimbardo was the Z- yes, yeah. guy who yeah. ran this study. Yeah. So, volunteers were assigned guards or prisoners with the flip of a coin. And this is in the basement of Stanford University. Okay. But they've made it up to be okay. like proper... And basically, they went fucking mental. They were like, these were people who were seemingly, again in big air quotes, normal people. Okay. And they, the guards became essentially evil. Like, as soon as they put sunglasses, they had to wear like these mirrored aviators. And as soon as they put them on, they would like, they were beating people. They were te- stopping them eating, locking them in like solitary confinement for anything. Mm. And the prisoners immediately just went like subservient. They just mm-hmm. accepted it mm. until they rioted and then tried to break out. Wow. Okay. And this is in the space of I can't. I'll check how long it ran for, but as a. But they knew they were taking part in an experiment. It totally disappeared. So they knew they were. They signed up for it. They signed all the paperwork. Mm -hmm. It was explained to them what was going to happen. And it it didn't matter. So it said um, 35 hours for the first prisoner to... uh, Zimbardo's description is number 8612 then began to act crazy scream curse and go into a rage that seemed out of control it took a while before we became convinced that he was really suffering and they had to release him oh goodness so they thought they were just wow but like people just flipped so what was the conclusions that were made by the um experimenters uh what is it So, paraphrasing, um, it's compatible with those of the Milgram experiment where random participants complied with orders to administer seemingly dangerous and potentially... Ah, so it was dependent upon the orders that they were given by the people that were running the experiment. It was for like the first few hours, then they just went rogue and did their own thing. Mm -hmm. So they'd be like, oh, it's time for the prisoners to eat. But then if the prisoners didn't eat, they'd lock them up. That was their call. They just did it. So it says, um, it's the simu- it's the environment rather than a personality trait, and it's been used to illustrate cognitive dissonance theory and the power of authority. Mm. But he's then ended up representing people in like war tribunals and stuff. Oh wow! So like, you cannot hold this person responsible for what they did. Okay. Because someone in authority, or what they perceived as authority, told them to do it. Oh, interesting. So... So as a defence, that yeah. it was a response to that, rather than anything internal, or... Yeah, like they've not made a conscious decision to do something. Right. They've just been totally conditioned by the mm. situation. It's why... There's a really good book that I can't remember the name of, but mm-hmm. it's well worth a look at. Okay. It's super heavy. Okay. really quickly it took it only lasted like two days and they were like in two days they were like we've gone too far okay like this got out of hand okay. it was meant to last for like a week or two weeks okay that's my next book then yeah it's really it's <laughs> you just realise that like the human mind is is super resilient in some ways but mm-hmm. if things get a bit hectic it can be pretty fragile Oh, yeah. yeah and it can yeah. go in random directions really quick. Yes, yeah. Like, it can yeah. not seem logical. Yeah. But I think 
from what I remember, the guy who he said like just lost it. It was like he wanted a pen, and they gave him the wrong color pen. It was something like super minor, right. and he was just like, "No, nah, I'm not having this anymore." And then it's obviously been disputed because every experiment's going to be disputed, mm. but it seems to sort of hold true. Is the Milgram experiment the one where you have a dial and an electric shock? I believe so. Button? I believe so. I have to confess that I studied that at A-level psychology, which was what? A few what, degrees ago. Uh, yeah, yeah, a good few ago. <laughs> and and uh, a number of decades ago. So I, I wouldn't rely on my memory to yeah. give you that now, I'm I, afraid. I think it, well, you have two groups of people separated and you can essentially decide to mm-hmm. either electrocute them or play loud music and how high up you'd go potentially yeah. with it yeah and Maybe people go oh we'll do one and see what happens yeah. and then they're like oh we'll do ten and see if they explode yeah. like wow they're in another room like nothing yeah. matters yeah 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 humans are wild I find it really like fascinating and impressive that you've or not just you, but anyone who like mm-hmm. deals with more than their own brain Brains. is doing something crazy. Like, Brains. Because yeah. dealing with mine is hard work sometimes. Yeah. And then to think that like, I, like we had a chat the other week and it's like, I sort of feel a bit bad because now oh, you're dealing with it a bit. <laughs> <laughs> <No>. <laughs> But yeah, it, it fascinates me, like what people do and what people are capable of. Because there's some people who physically should be incredible at sport, mm-hmm. but psychologically. Yeah. Yeah. Some, it's almost like they can't win, mm-hmm. like they don't understand how to win. Or they won't let themselves win. Yeah. But why? <laughs> like, why? Mm. What? It's. This could go on forever, but what causes that, like, not letting yourself win? Is it... So your belief is it's developmental, it's Mm. from... Yeah. So if someone's got children Mm -hmm. and are listening to this, how do they not fuck them up? (laughs) (laughs) Oh, dear. (laughs) Surely there should be a book or something. There is. there, is. And I think it is called How Not to Fuck Up Your Children. I think it's yeah. along those lines. Oh, that's... I don't know whether I've got it, to be honest. It might... Actually, it is. It's next door in the in the filing cabinet next door. I have got it, yeah. But look, um, in terms of parenting, in psychoanalysis, we talk about good enough parenting. Yeah. So like, your kids aren't on fire. Yeah. You know where they are. They've eaten. Good enough. It's all right. It's fine. <laughs> Okay, so there's, there is no such thing as perfect parenting. And if it is perfect parenting, it's not perfect parenting because actually they're not having to tolerate the challenging stuff. Yeah, so it might be easier, but it's not perfect. Yeah. Well, so we talk about the good and the bad. So um, we talk about good enough parenting is... There's some good stuff, but there's also some challenging stuff as well. So you have to disappoint your children. You have (laughs) to say you're not having that when you get to the checkout. I thought you just meant generally. (laughs) Oh, just generally, (laughs) as an individual. (laughs) Wow. (laughs) It's interesting your mind went there, Dad. (laughs) Just I'm really disappointed in you as a human. But actually, do you know, it's funny you reference that because you do. So kids, when they grow up, um, their their kind of father or their mother tends to be their hero. Yeah. And then they realise that they're human. Yeah, it's awful. And then you're really disappointed because your dad's no longer your superhero. You talk about your dad being the biggest guy you know, yeah. and then you go see a rugby player. But yeah. The weird thing was, um, well, apparently you just have a live therapy session. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Is. <laughs> There was a point when I'd grown up a bit when I realised that my mum was fucking awesome and she oh. did loads of really cool stuff. Ah. And before, like, because of single parent and 
all of that sort of stuff mm. sort of pushed against everything a lot mm. but I had like the opposite thing of spending most of my childhood thinking this person's a pain in the ass mm. to all of a sudden going she's pretty ace actually like she's done some really cool stuff and she right. keeps doing really cool stuff nice and then had to deal with this mess all the time you think yeah like again it goes back to the same thing with athletes and this like parents are humans yeah yeah and exactly like yeah. your parents aren't defined by that no the, their role is you know until you're 16 or 18 or whatever it is make mm-hmm. sure you stay alive and know mm-hmm. the right stuff to keep staying alive yeah but outside of that they're yeah. human people exactly yeah parent is just one part of who that individual is yeah yeah it's really yeah I could literally go on for hours about yeah. this because <laughs> I do find this side of stuff fascinating and mm. what actually goes on and what because there's like the common trait a lot of good athletes are a bit selfish and a bit mm. narcissistic and mm-hmm. like with climbing there's a whole thing when, you know, climbers are a bit tapped because it's a bit of a weird thing to want to do. Mm-hmm. Where you, go, you know, you put yourself in a situation where you cannot make a mistake. Yeah, yeah. And it's a weird thing to do. Mm. And trying to understand that is a wild journey. Yeah, yeah. It's, yeah, it's really cool. I'll go for, we'll sort of wrap it up. Okay. In a sort of pointless question (laughs) who's your favourite psychologist who's Who's number one oh my word you didn't prepare me for this no I thought I've just been looking at all the books looking at all my books there's a lot of Freud but there is a lot of Freud is that just because he did a lot that's because I trained as a psychodynamic psychotherapist and I had to buy them on the reading list (laughs) (laughs) so you might as well put them out (laughs) so I might as well you know I've read these you know (laughs) can't remember them but (laughs) Something about parents. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Something about sex. <laughs> no. I think yeah. the real issue is you want to sleep with your mother. Yeah. Well. <laughs> or yeah. do you? Yeah. Should you? Yeah. You don't. Here's another book. <laughs> you see, this is the stuff, right? So you've just touched on something there, the Oedipus complex, right? Yeah. So I think this is why people get freaked out with Freud. Yeah. So the Oedipus stuff is real right <laughs> that's a statement isn't it that, 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 figured out the thumbnail so yeah, no, yeah, that is a real statement okay like but it's not in the sense of the literal way in which it's interpreted yeah okay the stuff about liking your mother okay if we talk about that now it's the there are certain traits within the mother or unconscious traits within the parent that become internalized and repeated in future partners and it might make people really uncomfortable to think about that stuff yeah almost hopefully a (laughs) little bit (laughs) Might make us feel really uncomfortable to talk about that stuff. So it's not that you want to be with your mother, but it's ultimately that... The that traits that you were around in a developmental stage yeah. are comfortable to you. Exactly. And you want to find those. Comfortable, familiar, that's your template. So you go out into the world searching for it. Yeah. That's all it is. And so don't be scared of Freud. Yeah. Freud's wonderful. Sense. Yeah, he... <laughs> it's super interesting, but I think the issue is the go-to. If you yeah. mention Freud, people go, "Yeah, oh, it's that. Yeah, it's that guy." Yeah, and I think this is why a lot of people, when you mention psychoanalysis, they're like, "Whoa, not for me." But it's so helpful and useful to all of us. So the stuff that I've just spoken about, um, good enough parenting. You found that interesting, right? Or you were kind enough to yeah. pretend you were interested. <laughs> well, <laughs> not really my most favourite part. But, <laughs> but, but that 
comes from a theory in psychoanalysis that if I told you the theory now, I think you'd be like, oh my God, Amy, what are you talking about? But it, it comes from Kleinian theory about good breast, bad breast. But if right. I use those words, you'd be like, what? Yeah. And that, that's, you know, that's the thing yeah. with psychoanalysis that I think people get quite overwhelmed with the language that's used in it. It does, I suppose that, I don't want to say era of psychoanalysis, but that genre maybe, the language is pretty blunt. It's down the line. It's provocative as well, isn't it? Yeah. It's, you it's know, trying to sell books. Uh, like uh, <laughs> maybe that's what it was. <laughs> maybe that's what it was, you know. Sold more books if yeah. spoke about that stuff. Yeah. But if you think about all of these theories on a symbolic level, really useful. And clinically, I see it every day. Yeah. Yeah. Has there been... Because when was Freud prevalent quite a while like early 1900s yeah i don't know let's let's I'll, have a look do you want me to get a book i'll professionally google it again yeah uh, phone time again sigmund freud uh so he died in 1939 mm-hmm. and he was born in 1856 wonderful beard good work yeah. on that mm-hmm how and again it feels really reductionary but it's not meant to be but how is that still relevant like so much later Mm -hmm. the world is radically different to Mm -hmm. the world he was analyzing yeah but people aren't are they not though i don't think so that's a bit depressing you'd think we'd move on a bit yeah well oh my word I don't we're meant to be stopping soon aren't we but I think we are moving on a bit but in quite a scary way for me (laughs) yeah 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 so you know those frontal lobes that we were talking about earlier so I often talk about this I, I I get really worried that the way in which we're progressing with social media yeah and occupation and create do you want me to just stop talking no no i just i'm super <laughs> paranoid about technology okay so i keep checking that the red lights are still yeah on. yeah your lights are definitely working i feel like yeah. i've got the biggest shine on that i've ever yeah, had it's yeah a lot in it yeah there's a lot of shine and a lot of light it's hard to yeah. convince yeah. <laughs> people that it's just a casual chat yeah. <laughs> <laughs> i've never sweat so much in my life <laughs> And I used to row. And I... <laughs> it's easy. You're coxing. It's yeah, fine. it's fine. <laughs> Just fine. Sit that yeah. way. Yeah. Um, um, so, frontal lobes. Yeah. Uh... Yeah. So, really quite worried that frontal lobes are not fully developed until we're 25. Yeah. And if you think about social media. Oh, you like 10? Yeah. Netflix. Yeah. You don't have to wait anymore. So you don't have to wait for next week for a Friends episode to be on. No, you're annoyed. I'm guilty of this myself. Uh, I get frustrated if I can't watch all of something. There you go. And I grew up during the era of you watch it next week. Yeah. But in a relatively short, relatively very short amount of time, you just become conditioned to... I can do this. Yeah. Like, when was Freud around? I'll find out now. Yeah. I don't need to yeah. wait to find out. Exactly. Yeah. What do you reckon to the neuro link thing? The... Okay. So, as part of executive functioning, we have to learn to inhibit certain behaviours. Yeah. And that involves pushing the stop button or the pause button yeah because realistically we're just apes with thumbs we, if we're allowed to do if what we, we didn't wanted, have frontal lobes <laughs> yeah, yeah if you could okay. do what you wanted yeah people would be doing terrible things to themselves yeah. all the time yeah. so that's kind of our 
executive center that kind of makes us stop and think okay and emotionally regulate so kind of "Mm, okay i don't think i'm happy that someone's just done that but i'm just gonna sit on it rather than react yeah okay but this is social media you see so everything's immediate all of those comments just react just react football last week yeah people can sit behind their keyboards and react immediately without thought in an anonymous way and just react yeah and there's no filter there's no no filter exactly so our frontal lobes and is our filter that worries me though because that suggests that I mean, everyone sort of knows it, but there are some people who, if they don't have to have a filter, are mm-hmm. colossal assholes. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Okay. no, yeah. that's fine. <laughs> and, but what we know is that if the frontal lobes are still developing, um, if we're not developing these skills, um, our brains will not develop those pathways required for waiting and inhibiting. Right. And so are we... Um, producing the next generation which will be lacking in these skills that is wild that's really and that worries me that really yeah. worries me but yeah brains are pretty soft yeah like the i feel like yeah and i may be wrong but sort of neurological evolution can be fairly quick like things can change yeah 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 and especially with major situational changes yeah. things will change quickly yeah. yeah and like i said I, I grew up where you had to wait till next week to watch something yes exactly and yeah already I'm like, yeah why can't i watch all of yeah. this who releases yeah. a show once a week next episode want to yeah. watch it i want to yeah. watch all of it yeah why have you not texted me back yet yeah like Where's the two blue tits? Where are you? What are you yeah. doing? <laughs> What's going on? Like, yeah. why isn't... Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it is mm. wild to think, like, things are changing. Yeah. And it, and it prevents, like, if we go back to sport as well, it prevents people being able to be present in the moment and enjoy winning yeah. for what it is. Or just enjoy, maybe not winning, but enjoying the process of sport. Dare we suggest that? It'll you know, catch on. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> God, I hope it does. You know <laughs> that we could just enjoy it for what it is, and yeah. you know, it, it closes down that skill set, and we're always looking for the next thing. And yeah. then, when are you ever satisfied? Yeah, because you just. You want the instant gratification of other people appreciating what you've done rather than sitting back and appreciating what you've done yourself. Yeah. Have you seen what Elon Musk is on about doing with the neural link? No. So essentially drilling a hole in people's skull and putting stuff in there. When you say stuff, like what stuff? Oh, like electrodes, wires and stuff. Oh, so the point okay. originally is for people who have suffered traumatic brain injuries yeah. or yeah. Yeah. paraplegic or whatever yeah. to Mm-mm. restore motor function. Yes, and clinically that has been done for a number of years now, I believe, for yeah. certain conditions. I saw a video of a banjo player having brain surgery to oh. reconnect stuff. Wow. And they had them playing banjo in the operating room and genuinely it was like is it this bit and he'd play something wrong and they're like oh not that bit let's yeah Yeah. we we don't yeah we need to keep that intact we don't need to go into that area yeah um but yeah then the thought is like his plan is to get rid of phones through doing this so you can have information immediately Oh, wow. And part of me thinks that's really cool. What? So it bypasses the kind of visual perception? And in your brain. Just in, in there. Just, just straight in. Pop it in. Pop a bit of more knowledge. Ooh. 
So you can be thinking about when was Freud born and you'll know the information will be there. Oh my word. Which I don't know if that's five or ten or fifty years off. Mm. But that is like immediate gratification. Wow. And you have no Wow. No way around. Well, the way around it is to not have it. But if you go down that route, mm. it's just there. I, I don't quite know how to respond to that. That's wow. That's it's yeah. tripping. <laughs> like, that, that's yeah, that's tough to get your head around. Yeah. What, what do you think of that? I think it's initial application of making people better and restoring the physical or cognitive function mm. that has been removed through trauma or genetics or whatever is brilliant. Mm. But I think it's really handy that we have dumb people in the world. And getting rid of that and giving, without being derogatory, at the same time as being incredibly derogatory. My opinion is racist people are stupid. Like, on some level, they're not that smart because it's a super illogical thing to be. Mm. And if it gets rid of racism, if it gets rid of things like that and gets rid of bias, then it's a good thing. But if it makes racist people smarter, mm. then I think, you know, you're going down the line of the argument, uh, speaking to Dale McPherson, a strong man about when people go on about roid rage. And the issue is, some people are assholes, and then they take steroids, mm. and it just accelerates that. Mm-hmm. Whereas if you're not normally a bad person, taking drugs won't turn you into this person. Mm-hmm. And my concern with something like that is, if you've got these people who are, have a predisposition to doing bad things or thinking bad things, will it allow them to be better at doing bad things? Mm. And who controls that? Well, no, it's not. That's the thing. It's not about being controlled. It's about allowing information to be accessible. So there's loads of, like, that's a massive philosophical debate anyway. So yeah, yeah listening to a guy called Hamilton Morris talk who's a pharmacologist Mm -hmm. and he synthesises drugs in a lab but he also goes out and takes drugs around the world in their native and intended way and he says that it's his theory that no drugs should be illegal everyone should have the right to make the decision about it Mm. and I sort of agree that Limiting people's rights is bad, mm. but equally giving people loads of power and control mm. could be really good. Mm. But if it goes the wrong way, then it could go really the wrong way. Yeah, absolutely. Really quickly. Yeah, yeah. Is what like there's so much going on in the world that yeah just doesn't have an answer. Mm-hmm. And it yeah. makes doing a podcast about those things really tricky because there's no conclusion. No, there isn't. There isn't. And people, I said to you when we spoke, I, was like, I could do like a magic wand, but there isn't one. The magic wand is changing or hard work or doing something. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And there isn't an answer to a lot of the discussions we've had. There's no black and white answer no. to it. No, there isn't. But the discussion needs to be had. Yes. And that's like a massive step to yeah. be able to discuss what's going on. Like one of the really fascinating ones was there's a professor at Columbia University who uses heroin every day. Oh, goodness, okay. But as soon as you say someone uses heroin, the reaction is, oh, but it's, like it's an opioid. It's the best opioid there is. He gets natural stuff, he takes he like essentially micro doses with it, he says it makes him feel really good, treated his depression, treated his anxiety, he oh, feels wow. great. Oh my goodness. But what he could do is go to a normal doctor and get prescribed a brand name opioid which has got loads of side effects and is super addictive and leads on to this. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. 
but there is no right answer to that no no like yeah there isn't a right route to take mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and then with like the arguments with like psychoactive drugs and like using uh i can't remember how you say it, uh psychosilin magic mushroom right. chemicals apparently treats depression gets like gets rid of anxiety right okay to use it in mexico to and i hate using the word cure a lot of the time mm-hmm. but to cure addiction people have alcohol addiction take magic mushrooms don't want to drink anymore and I think people should have the right to explore that. Mm. But then equally, some things need control. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And a billionaire putting microchips in your brain on some level needs to be controlled. Like, absolutely. Because yeah. it's nuts. Yeah, yeah. And if you think being able to watch a series on Netflix is going to mess with people's brains popping something in there. Don't know whether we should conclude it in that sense. <laughs> I could see some sensationalist headlines. But hopefully, yeah, oh God, Netflix will be after me, won't they? Yeah, that's, that's it. That's Luckily, terrible. they don't have books, so... Fuck that's them. terrible. <laughs> oh God, damn. <laughs> I think really it's just about, you know, like what uh, we know uh, Nashi doing, Alan Nash, yeah. so you know how he's now got a page for his family and yeah. they're into kind of outdoor stuff um, activities, water, paddle boarding, great. See, that's yeah. the stuff that kind of being present, enjoying the environment and the space, waiting, emotional regulation, that's yeah. all wonderful stuff. Yeah, staying human. Yes. Probably a good thing. Yeah, absolutely. Because otherwise we're just chimps <laughs> or super robots, and neither of those are great. Yeah, this is about balance. Yeah. All about balance. Wanna... There's the take home. Yeah, we'll end on that because it's <laughs> two hours and 40 minutes. Wow. It was... We're going to have to cut that, right? No, nah, we'll just chuck it out. It'll oh, wow. It's, it is what it is. So <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> That's the joy of this sort of thing. I, yeah. I spent three hours listening to Joe Rogan talking to Bert Crescher about essentially nothing. Oh. They were just having a chat. There's an audience for this? Yeah, yeah, massive. Oh, okay. okay. Like, <laughs> I hope. <laughs> okay. Um, but it's been an absolute pleasure to talk to you. Yeah, Thank you too. for coming on. Yeah. Um, because we said it about an hour ago, where can people get your book and where can people find you? Yeah, so um, I feel quite cognitively fatigued. It's been an intense conversation, Tell me about hasn't it? it? <laughs> yeah. Um, so, where can people get the book? So, Amazon, yeah. uh, Waterstones, yeah. WH Smith, or from the publisher direct, actually, which yeah. is so they haven't run out of it yet. <laughs> so, that's okay. probably the best option. Um, and it's firingthemind.com. Yeah. yeah. Just the... search skew to the right, sport, mental health, and vulnerability easier than searching for my surname yes yeah. and i'm gonna get a phonetic breakdown of how to say yeah. it when i do the thanks <laughs> I'm, so far i've gone with Iziki, but i feel like that's wrong almost yeah yeah, yeah almost um social media you... yeah i'm on instagram at amy Iziski. you see this is Iziski. the barrier right no one can find me i will <laughs> Put it typed out in video descriptions and the okay. podcast, podcast <laughs> description. So Thank you. just copy that. Don't try and do it phonetically. Yeah. There'll be way too many letters. Yeah. <laughs> um, as always, thank you for listening to another episode of the Dan Hipkiss podcast. Like, comment, subscribe, ring the bell, do all the stuff that makes YouTube and Spotify think other people should listen to this. And yeah, take it easy, guys.